You're watching the Academy Awards. Can you start by sharing the story of when you were 10 years old? Oh, that story. And you're watching the Academy Awards, wow. the limos, the glam, and then they announced that Sidney Poitier wins the Academy Award. I was, sitting, I was sitting on the linoleum floor, and as I think about it, I can feel the linoleum, and watching on a Magnavox black and white TV, and Sidney Poitier getting out of a limousine is the first time I've actually seen a black man getting out of a limousine, and nobody was dead. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that got my attention. And then he wins, and I don't, even think I knew at the time what an Oscar was, because it wasn't like I was 10 years old in Milwaukee, and it wasn't like I was watching movies. But standing there watching him receive the award is the first time I had the thought, because we were called colored at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had the thought that if a colored man could do that, if he could do that, mm -hmm. I wonder what I can do. For Oprah Winfrey, this early memory was a turning point and ultimately inspiration to produce a new documentary about the man who became her mentor and friend called Sidney. You think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. Sidney Poitier was raised on Cat Island in the Bahamas by his parents who were tomato farmers. The world I knew was quite simple. I didn't know there was such a thing as electricity or that water could come into the house through a pipe. I never thought about what I looked like. I didn't know what a mirror was. Poitier moved to the United States at 15 with no blueprint for the racism he'd face when he arrived. I just go, how did he do it? Mm. How did he with no role models, with no with no template before him and he made a path for all of us. Oscar-nominated producer Reginald Hudlin directed films including Boomerang, Marshall, and now Sydney. Uh, particularly as a filmmaker, what did he mean to you? Well, he meant so much to me as a man. Mm. I mean, uh, besides my father, he was the temple of what manhood was. Mm. The intelligence, the courage, the intensity, the discipline, the moral compass. Integrity. We could just rock them all mm. day. Yeah, rock them all so day. many words that sum up the measure of a man. Mm. And that was just kind of in my DNA. I wasn't fully conscious of it until I started making the movie. And I'm like, oh, that's what he means to me. Of course, I know his importance as an actor and how he transformed popular culture on a global basis. I, I knew when he became a filmmaker and he had the most successful black film ever made, you know, Stir Crazy, a record that held for 20 years. I was very conscious of Which that. Which is still one of the funniest mm. things ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. It's one of the funniest things ever. Right, and a guy who is known for being an amazing dramatic actor who turns out to have an amazing talent for comedy. Mm -hmm. The talent and the, and the breadth of skills keep growing and growing and growing. Quincy Jones had a 42nd birthday party for me. Sidney Poitier was there. And I remember going downstairs, turning a corner, and he was just standing there. And I froze because here's my hero. Not everybody gets to meet their heroes. Not everybody does. And most importantly, most of the times when you meet your heroes, your heroes do not measure up. Mm. In this case, he exceeded every measurement I ever could have imagined. How did he make you feel? What he was able to do as you will hear from anybody who's ever known him, is that he made everybody who was in his presence feel like they were the most important person he'd ever been with. And he had a deep curiosity and love of human beings, period, no matter who it was he met. There, you couldn't be out to lunch or dinner with him where he wasn't speaking to the waiter or he wasn't asking to see the chef or going into the kitchen and talking to the people. He had that quality about him that everyone was seen and felt in his presence. But what he made me feel was something, uh, when I met him, was something beyond anything I can even describe in an interview. I mean, I, I believe that we were soulmates. We used to talk mm -hmm. about uh, the fact that we certainly had met in another universe at another time. For Sherry, Anika, and Beverly, three of the icon's daughters, he was just dad. For all three of you guys, um, 
What was it like for you guys as children to see such adoration for your, your father? Were you aware of the magnitude of his impact or was it when you got a little bit older? Okay, I mean, this is going to sound terrible, but, you know, it was very annoying because we couldn't go anywhere. Mm. You know, we would go to Disneyland and people would stop you every, you know, few feet. Oh, my mm. God. Oh, my God. Is that Sidney Poitier? Yeah. So my sister and I, we were in the back and we were really kind of tired of this. Mm. So this lady said, is, is that Sidney Poitier? And we said, no. People always think that. <laughs> 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 and he heard us. And he was livid. Hmm. He said, it is because of women like that and those people that we're here today. Mm. You don't res disrespect them. Mm. And, you know, that was like, oh, okay. I think I knew always what he did. And I knew that because people would constantly say, do you know how lucky you are to have a father that you have? And so I had an idea, but I didn't until I was older have any understanding of the impact that he had on so many people. I used to think that he was God mm. because he knew so much. And I would look at him and say, man, how do you know all these things? Really? Mm. He would tell me how many uh, stars there were in, in the sky. Well, who told you? <laughs> you know, I was like, it, the way every dinner time, we would sit around the table and just listen to what he had to say because it was fantastic. Um, oh my God, it was wonderful. I would say, we've got to be home for dinner. Wow. Oh yes, had to be home for dinner because I wanted to find out what daddy was going to talk about. Mm. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not DC as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man, it's okay. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I was watching some of his films and re-watching some of his films, particularly Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And I just lost my grandfather. Mm -hmm. He's 90, he was 98 years old. And they were about the same age, they were about three years apart. And my grandfather was a physician. And I remember my grandmother would show me these pictures of my grandfather dressed to the nines, so honorable, so kind. And so I remember watching Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and there's the scene where he's in this suit. And I pulled up a picture of my grandfather at the mm -hmm. same time. Oh. Where he's in a suit. Oh. But I think for me, there were so many men who lived so honorably, black men, and not just necessarily physicians. Mm -hmm. And I thought about perhaps, you know, for the first time he finally was able to see himself projected on the big screen and men like him and there were so many of them um, you know and they weren't diminished they weren't devalued they were able to keep their heads up we know what that meant and also for whites to see that on the big screen can I, any of you talk about the importance finally of seeing that representation you know you look at the history of cinema from birth of a nation on all these horrific images that demean and diminish black humanity mm. and suddenly he emerges fully formed from the very beginning. 
with the intelligence mm. and the intensity and the courage and the class and the elegance and the moral compass, everything that he is. And he makes the right decision every time. He picks everything. the right role. He plays it right. He refuses to do anything that diminishes himself or anyone that looks like him, mm. anyone that he represents. And he does it for decade after decade after decade, and he never makes a mistake. It's an impossible achievement. And then when he gets behind the camera, he brings yes. other black people behind yeah. the camera in. He Open in. the doors. Open the doors for so many others. Right. And I stand here as a grandchild of his. Mm. You know, and all my peers today, actors, filmmakers, all of us, we all stand on the shoulders of Sidney Poitier. But it's much bigger than entertainment. Please don't. Oh, Let's we'll get there. Absolutely, here. absolutely. You don't have Barack Obama if you don't have Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. Oprah, you talked about the scene in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner where Sidney's character told his father, let me read this, you think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. Mm. And you went on to say that defined Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, one of the multitude of reasons why I have such admiration, love and respect for him is because he came to the United States by the time he was 15 as a fully whole human being. There was no hole to feel in terms of his own identity. Mm -hmm. And one of the, my favorite stories that he tells in the documentary is about not even knowing what color he was or what color was until he was 10 years old because he didn't even know what a mirror was. Mm -hmm. He'd never even seen himself in the mirror. And so, as is the case with a lot of people who are raised in all black countries or all black communities where race is not an issue and you literally are defined by the content of your character and the content of his character was established by his parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing you can read or hear or any story that's ever told about him that is not grounded in Reginald and Evelyn Poitier. There's also a part in the documentary that takes us to 1967, 1968, this time of civil unrest. Did he ever talk about what was that like when things are spiraling literally around him and he's this Hollywood star? There's always that question. Do the times make the man or does the man make the times, mm -hmm. right? And you know, the answer is always a little bit of both. So here, here is this revolutionary force that's transforming Hollywood, that's transforming uh, political activism. He's all these things at once. He's carrying the entire um, uh, uh, transformational moment on his back. Because mm. he's carrying it on his back because he's the one that we see. He's the one that's visible. He's yes. it. And he's willing to take the burden, mm -hmm. right? Which is not a small thing. And he, and he knows he can't just be it on screen. He has to live it in his life. He's doing this. 1967, he's the number one box office star on the planet Earth. He has a triple, uh, three movies that come out in the same year that I don't think anyone has ever matched. To Sir With Love, In the Heat of the Night, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, all in the same year. And at the same time, The Defiant Ones is playing on TV. Mm. So he owns 1967. He is the symbol of all the transformation, the inflection point in this country. And in 1968, everything changes. We lose Martin Luther King. You know, he has all these you know, terrible losses in his own life. Mm -hmm. He and, and the culture who he's leading now moves ahead of him. But they don't. Because the reality is he has a moral center and he has a value system which is classic which is why it's important to tell the story. When we really say, okay, let's take a look at what this man did from a historical perspective, you go, he was always right. He yeah. was always the leader. And there's so many lessons that today we need to learn from him. Yeah. And, his, and his integrity is inflappable mm -hmm. you, it, in, and, and infallible. You cannot deny that he has lived the most extraordinary life mm -hmm. because of his value system. It's the way he operated and the way he carried himself. And this sense of elegance and presence that everybody talks about uh, was not an external thing because he didn't view himself as a movie star. He considered himself a man and a father, first mm. and foremost. Did it come with the weight 
a pressure? I know at times he talked about feeling lonely. It's always hard being the first. When you're the first to do anything, people are coming at you from all sides. And in the case with him, black people are coming against you, white people are coming against you saying, how dare you, how dare you, who do you think you are, who do you think you are? It's one of the reasons he and I connected so well. In our very first meeting, I had a conversation with him about what do you do with all the criticism and trying to be everything for everybody? And he said, my dear, it's challenging when you're carrying other people's dreams. Mm. Yes. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? What kind of training regimen? How you doing, Lester? You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. This is what it looks and feels. The storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> I do want to sing your mother's praises for a second. Mm. The story that got me, uh, Beverly and Sherry, it was when your father bought your mother a mink. And yes. she chose to, you know, take that return it or what, whatever she mm -hmm. did, but invest it, mm -hmm. right, into mm -hmm. a raisin in the sun um, and becoming, in fact, the largest investor on Broadway. Mm -hmm. We know how successful it was. We know what it meant to your father. But how about that, even at that time, to invest, well, you, you know? know? When she was at Columbia, before she married Daddy, she was studying accounting. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, she grew up Makes in um, Alabama, Bridgeport, Alabama, and her grandmother was kind of like the you know leader of the town because she made sure she found out how to get school buses for the kids so they didn't have to hop the train. Mm. So, I mean, she's, she was always in, involved in that kind of stuff. She's always involved in, you know, organizations and helping people and NAACP and all that kind of stuff. So that's just who she is. And, you know, today she would do something like that. Well, long before it was a phrase on a T-shirt, he was clearly a loving girl dad. So what do you remember about your dad growing up? Well, I remember we used to travel a lot. Um, we'd be in a hotel room and bored. And so we would dress him up. And we would put makeup on him and do his hair with bows and barrettes. And then we would call room service <laughs> and order food and make him go to the door and answer it. Oh, no! It was just pure fun with his kids. It was just genuine and loving. And he loved to just make us laugh and giggle. I love that. You know, it's funny, you know, I come from a blended family and the same thing with my father. He wants to make sure that each of us feel his love. And that was so clear with your father as well. Did you feel it even individually? Yes. I had a party. I was 16 or something and he was in Europe. It was a good party. He's dancing and everything. And around, <laughs> you know, 9 o'clock, 9.30, mommy says, uh, you have a phone call. And I was like, oh, okay. The party's over. <gasps> what? What? <laughs> From Europe. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> you know? I said, Daddy, it's only 9.30. He said, the party's over. I hung up the phone. I said, he's in Europe. <laughs> what is he going to know? <laughs> 15 minutes later, 
I hear people. <gasps> I was like, I can't catch a break. I mean, no matter where I am, what I do, he's there. He knows what I'm doing, <laughs> you know. As long as he was around, I was going to, I was going to be safe. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, I drove from New York to D Texas when I got married the first time. And I was scared to go through the South. And I told Daddy, I said, I, you know, I'm kind of scared to drive down there. He said, you'll be fine. And for me, it meant, oh, he must have hired some people to follow me. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Mm -hmm. So Lenny Kravitz said this quote, and I wrote it down because I liked it. It says, he came to this earth to move it. Beyond acting, he went on to direct and produce, start a production company, and he opened doors for so many others. When you read his biographies, you see, just as in the life of any famous person or pers people who've done great things in the world, most people don't start out, and neither did he, to say, I'm going to do great things mm -hmm. in the world. I'm going to, I'm here in the world to move it and to shake it. I think it is the force of his being. It is the will of who he decided he was going to be as, as a man that allowed him to do all of the great things. And it is his innate sense of love for himself and love for his family that he was able to exude that come that literally comes from the core truth of who he is and was as a man that we saw expressed in the world mm -hmm. so through his art we got to see who he was as a man who he was as a father who he was as a husband who he was as a friend but all of that really the reason why the love is so deep for him, for me, and I think for all who cared for him, is because we know that was real. Mm -hmm. That was real. That wasn't just some external star power people were looking at. That was the real man. Mm. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful get life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I wave. Love the ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> the big variable is storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? <laughs> kind of training How you doing, Leslie? Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I talked about just losing my grandfather, mm -hmm. and I remember towards the end knowing that there would be a time where I couldn't just call, mm. and he would pick up the phone. And now I miss the, the conversations. Tell me about your day, and he would just listen. Um, what do you miss? You yeah, know, sorry. I miss him so much now, and I know we all do, but I miss him because of these times. I mean, yes, I used to talk to him, every, and then I just feel like he would be able to help all of us sort out these makes sense times. Of it. Yes, make some sense of it. So I, yeah. miss, our, I miss our phone calls. Yeah. I do too. You yeah. know, I, I just miss calling or picking up the phone and it's daddy and you know, we start talking and we talk you know, quite a long time about different things and you know, the cosmos, as, you know, he was very much into yes. Yes. <laughs> He was very much into the stars and the yeah. planets and what yeah. was going on. And he told and me And the forces time, and the yes, forces. Yes, he said, you know, I think I could just live out my days going into space into, you know, like a spaceship and just live out my days. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, mm. but. I'd say, let's go. You know, he was <laughs> just like, you know. No, he said he was going, Sherry, you're not going. <laughs> but. <laughs> but <laughs> 
<laughs> I, think he would, I think he would have actually, you know, taken oh, one of those pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he would have done Definitely. it. Definitely. Yeah. I miss, oh, it's going to make me cry. I, I miss hugging him. And sometimes I can still, like, there's like a muscle memory. You can still feel the person, even though they're not here. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But, yeah, I miss, I miss, I miss hugging him, and I miss this, you know, he was very silly. <laughs> and, you know, the little, th it's the little things that I miss, you know, the weird exercises he would make up to do to stay healthy, you know, mm -hmm. that were, did nothing for him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I miss talking to him. I still talk to him, but yeah. it's the physicalness, I think, is the hardest for me, like not being able to go and see him or hold his hand or you know, get that look that everything is going to be okay. Right. You know, it's, calm down. It's fine. <laughs> Those are the things. And sure, what about you? His laughter. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I love when that. he clap his hands and fall <laughs> out. And yes. Oh my God! Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, I just miss his laughter. Do you still feel him? Every day. Every day. How often do you think of him? I mean, all the time. How do I not think of him? It's, mm -hmm. you know, he's in everything that I do, you know. He's in my children. I see, like, his laughter. My son has his laugh. Oh, it's like, you know, he's still so present. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so interesting, Beverly, when you were saying that you had a chance to see the documentary, and even for you as his daughter, to see his life play out. You know, I watched it, and... I knew all the, I knew the story, I knew all of the things, but it's like you hear people say so often, you know, he changed the world, he made life, you know, places better for everybody. He was so this, he was so that. And I I kept watching it and and wanting to recognize or feel what everybody else saw, but he, to me he's always going to be daddy exactly. you know mm. he's just always going to be daddy the person who does it the right way <laughs> who expects you to do it the right way and the person who wants you to be honest the person who is making sure that he represents his family well and i think that he instilled that in us did you have to you know you're not here by yourself you can't run around and do stuff and just be insulated whatever you do ripples through so my father is was a great man and it was just watching the movie it was just like an amen after a sermon oh. well. wow. oh. and i will say that it's a testament to what you guys did because mm -hmm. it is it is the essence of him you guys mm. captured the essence of him in the film and that it's, was the goal that's such a compliment because that was the goal that was yeah you know, it's... That was the goal. I was hoping to make the final gift mm -hmm. to all of us because he meant everything to all of us, whether you knew it or not. And we can now share some of those amazing lessons we all learned so we can all benefit. You know you made him proud when you hear his daughter say that you captured your, their father. How mm -hmm. did that feel? We said from the beginning when we sat down, uh, to talk about what we wanted to do. So you all honor us so much with your words because our intention has been fulfilled because the family just told us exactly what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And the intention was an offering. He used the word gift and I said, it's an offering to the world mm -hmm. so that the world can come to know him as we do. And so the world can see the best of themselves reflected in the best man I have ever known. He is the best man I have ever known, heard, read about. I, I don't know anybody more extraordinary than Sidney Poitier. into the arena mm -hmm. 
Are you gonna miss this moment? Everyone, Roger! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes and no, because it is always connected to a lot of nerves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you get nervous still? I, get, I, I used to get a lot, a very nervous in the beginning and then towards the end uh, less, you know, but yeah. still uh, the hours, you know, and hours and hours before mm -hmm. just the thought of playing a night session match in front of a lot of people. Oh. Uh, yeah, it can be draining, you know, but so I will not miss that part of being like, oh, waiting, waiting all day. Yeah. Uh, but this moment where the whole crowd, you know, chants her name or is so happy to see you, it really is what you didn't work for or go into rehab for or do surgeries for. It's <laughs> yeah. true. You why know? you work so hard. Yeah, yeah. You, why you work hard, yeah. Absolutely magnificent. In more than 1,500 matches over 24 years, Roger Federer gave his heart, soul, and body to the game he loves, making the decision to retire not easy. How did it feel to press send on the announcement that you are retiring? It was good. It was the right thing to do. Um, I've played for long, long enough uh, not to second guess myself on it. Uh, it was more stressful just getting the words right, uh, the letter, the audio, audiogram, audio form, what I did. <laughs> just a stressful day until I hit the button. Have you been able to absorb all the accolades mm -hmm. and the headlines and this moment? Have you been able to soak it in? I actually haven't seen much. Uh, TV footage or uh, things that TV stations have put together yet. Uh, so I think, I hope that a lot of people and friends of mine are assembling everything and then once after the Labour Cup is over, I can have a proper look at uh, everything that was uh, said and, and done for me. Well, take me through it. I mean, it seemed like even as recently as Wimbledon, you were still holding out some hope yeah. that you could return. How did you come to the realization that the body was just not going to be able to I do was, it anymore? I mean, I was already very unsure if I should show up at Wimbledon because I was hurt and um, having not played for a year. Um, so I didn't know if I was supposed to be there. And uh, anyway, totally the right call to make to go, to go there. And when I spoke on the court, I said, I hope I see you all next year yeah. playing. And I really meant that because I really still have belief that I was going to make it. Um, a couple of weeks later, I really felt the knee is no good. I did a scan. It wasn't where I wanted it to be. And this is when then I said, OK, you know what? I, I know what I need is a break. And I remember the first couple of weeks when I went on vacation, I was so exhausted from just doing rehab every single day and trying to come back. And with that news in my mind, thinking like this, I'm not sure if this is going to continue this whole career. But I really didn't want to talk to Mirko or anybody really about it. Um, I could feel the weight. Waking up in the mornings was really difficult. Uh, I needed loads of sleep, just exhausted, you know. And then when I came back from vacation, I could really feel the feeling growing in me that I don't think I can make it back. And then you go into the next mode of keeping it a secret, who do you share it with, and how do we continue from here on forward, and where do you announce it? And that, that, that's an um, uncomfortable period because you don't want it to leak. and. Uh, at the end, it all worked out. Is it one of those things where they say sometimes there's the stages of grief, like the stages mm -hmm. of acceptance and then kind of frustration? Yep. And did you feel all those feelings? Yes, all of it. And also the ones where I don't want to deal with it. Like I explained before in vacation, like I just don't want to think about it. Don't mm -hmm. talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. And then I do feel I, I went through a lot of um, sadness and emotional uh, moments where um, just, you know, how you start thinking about everything you're going to miss. Mm -hmm. And then you start going like, oh my God, I'm going to miss people, fans, tournaments, uh, the travels, um, the beautiful dinners we had after mm -hmm. matches won, matches lost, when tournaments ended, uh, seeing my friends in London, in Paris, in New York, in Tokyo, you name it. And then you just think, oh my God, my, my life's going to be miserable <laughs> after. And then you realize, no, 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 actually, we're going to have more time. So we're going to do all these amazing things now. So it's going to be great, you know, and uh, I think it has helped me to be able to do this interview today in a normal way and not break down emotionally because tennis means a lot and I love um, I love the sport so so much so it's hard to let go because I've done it forever but I can with those few weeks and months that have gone by I really feel like I'm in, in, a, in a good place and it shows that I've also accepted uh, uh, the situation. It's um, I mean it's the life that you've known mm -hmm. it's the life you've known since you were a little kid. 
yeah. It's hard to say goodbye. It's brutal um, because I always went to training most of the time, especially the last 25 years or maybe more 30 years with a purpose. Okay, I'm going to work on my forehand. We're going to work on the footwork. Mm -hmm. We're going to, and now all of a sudden that will all fall away. And when I go play tennis, it'd be, who cares <laughs> how my forehand <laughs> is or who cares about all these things? So it's a, it's a, it's a big step because it's been the rock of my life, you know. Everything was around tennis, all my friends were around tennis, mm. all my, my daily schedules have been around it, and um, now all of a sudden it's going to be different. And for me, maybe also what's been a little bit, uh, how do you say, um, maybe more complicated than for others, I've, I've really tried to not think about retirement until it was the case. And I always said that because the more you think about it, retirement, and I was asked a lot for since 2009, really. I think I asked you once. Also, <laughs> you have to. And the more you're already retired. So I really tried to push it away as long as possible. So when it, all of a sudden it hit me and, and I realized that was it. Um, like you said, there were so many different emotions coming up. Well, you promised me you'd never retire. <laughs> I'll play XOs, I'll play, I'll still play tennis, but just not for points. <laughs> you know what strikes me about you is that here you were playing professional tennis for 24 years and it seems to me that you love it as much today. Mm -hmm. It's as much a thrill as it was in the beginning. Yeah. And that's very unusual for a professional athlete. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, if I had it my way, I would have loved to have a chance to play fit and see what's still possible. Mm -hmm. But I knew uh, I was on thin ice for a long time. The last few years have been really, really hard. And um, look, I've given it all and I still can play tennis after with my kids, with my friends. So it's, I'm not going anywhere, really. It was just a, a matter. The tour is, is a tough place. It's grueling and uh, it's definitely the right decisions and I'm not coming back. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm too old for that. I was going to say, you know, unretiring is a thing now. I know. No, no, I am definitely done. I know that, yeah. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? What <laughs> kind of training regimen? How you doing, Lester? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? <laughs> what kind of training regimen? How you doing, Lester? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I thought one of the most moving lines in your letter that you wrote was the last one. Finally, to the game of tennis, I love you and will never leave you. It really is what I feel, you know. I feel that tennis has given me everything and I'll always be there for the game because the game has been there for me and my kids will be playing tennis. I'm always happy to mentor kids. I'm always happy to help uh, maybe a Swiss Tennis Federation, or I'm always maybe still going to travel to tournaments. I'll always be a fan. So in some shape or form, I think I'll always be involved because I think it's so important that we, the tennis players, stay involved in our sport that has given us the platform and everything. So I just wanted to let the people know I'll be there and I want to be there myself as well. You also talked about the fans. Mm -hmm. What has it meant to you to have these fans who are so devoted and so devout and rooting for you <laughs> all over the world like every match was a home game for Roger Federer. How do you Federer. know? How do you know they're like I, that? I don't know. I might be one of them. You might have heard. <laughs> no, but uh, it's that's like my number one concern, you know, and uh, 
is, is them not being able to spend more time with them. I just met a fan uh, now at the airport uh, I was, as I was coming here. She said, I'll miss the three o'clock in the morning wake ups when you're playing in Australia. I was like, really? And she has tears in her eyes. And I just felt like that, that's what it is. That's what I will miss too, is those moments and encounters with people after matches and they're able to tell you how they felt and you're able to have a quick conversation. It's been incredible. I can't ever thank them enough. So You said even some of your successes would have been a little lonelier without all those fans. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, hello, we just went through COVID and I always said if I would have won any slam or any big tournament with no fans in the crowd, I think it would have taken away 80% of my, my emotions or 80% of what it would really mean. The fans are everything, really. So, it, you know, it's impossible to single out when you've had 1,500 matches, but on your personal highlight reel, what are the moments that you really treasure? You would think, you know, somehow it all is with milestones, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, you think back maybe to your very, very first match, but that is not even the tour level match. You know, it could be your first qualifying match at a tournament. Um, then it could be um, first time on center court at Wimbledon when I played Sampras uh, in 2001. Then your first time you break into top 10. I did that in Hamburg, I remember in 2002 when I won the, uh, the first Masters 1000 in my career. Then my first Wimbledon title, 03, and then you take it in your stride all of a sudden because then things are different, expectations have changed completely. And I had those runs of years where I barely lost and played almost 100 matches every year um, with some doubles as well. And obviously, just uh, when you're world number one for the very first time, uh, there's so many things that come on, on top of it, you know, um, press requests. And I feel like probably I'm the athlete who's done most most interviews ever. I am, I am convinced, I am, because I've done it after, before every game, after every game, time and time again in different languages. I was just saying, in three languages too. I've, I've done it endlessly. And I think um, 2017, of course, uh, you know, uh, when I won again after coming back from injury against Ruff in Australia, a place that also means so much to me. A lot of the times those close matches against great players, let's say also five setters, connect you forever to that one single person and there's so many players I've played against on tour and without them also I wouldn't be where I am today. I've always wondered like how did you hold on to yourself when you were like a rocket ship? There was that period of years where you basically couldn't lose and mm. didn't lose. How did you remember who you were? Yeah it, it's a great question because um, yeah you, you, you riding the wave right and you think everything's so simple but I remember now looking back, I would win a tournament and it's, it's just all about packing, leaving, organizing flights. Next thing you know, years go by and you look back and you're like, wow, my God, I won like 300 matches. I won like 25 tournaments. It's just a blur. And I said at one point I, I, we, with my wife, Mirka, we said, stop, 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 stop. We can leave the next day. Maybe the preparation is a little less good, but we have to save our moments because all of a sudden maybe we will not win the 51st title or the 73rd title or the 100th title, uh, it might dry out and it will end at some point, you know. And I think there you really need a good team that helps you organize it or a great wife that is able to uh, help you through it all. How did you stay humble? Because I think, it seems you really did. Yeah, I mean, I think so. But, uh, you know, you have to, I always said you have to adapt. I don't think I changed. I had to adapt to a new situation, to, to fame and to all that. But I think my, my home country, Switzerland, has helped me a, a great deal because in Switzerland we don't get carried away or you're not allowed to. Uh, they will let you know. And then my parents uh, and their upbringing. And, uh, and I think also all my friends always knew they could call me up and tell me, what are you talking about? Like, how are you behaving? Like, this is not who you used to be. And I think this is what has always kept me very grounded and very normal. That's why I still live in Switzerland today. I will, will always live there. I love that place. But uh, um, yeah, what a journey it's been and uh, happy it ends kind of here. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? What kind of training regimen? Thank you, Lester. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. 
But let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah, you are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You had those those years of meteoric success. You also then had some wilderness years where mm -hmm. you were out there, but there were years that passed between Grand Slam titles. Mm -hmm. Did you ever want to give up in those moments? Did you have um, a low point no. at that time? I mean, look, uh, I have twin girls, as you know, Myla and Charlene. They were born in 09, just after I became, uh, I think I was world number one. and. Uh, the girls were born, and from that moment on, 2010 and 11, I didn't win any slam. Uh, 10, I did, I think, win the Australian Open. But then 11, 12, everything's literally a blur in between. I remember changing diapers, bathing the girls, um, just being a dad. And of course, I didn't have any time to think about retirement. It was too early anyways. I was only just 30 years old. But then when the boys were born, uh, twin boys, Leo and Lenny, they were born in 2014. Things really, that, I mean, that rocked the boat, obviously, because uh, going on the road with four kids every single week was, was hard, to say the least, you know, and I think I sometimes forgot how hard it was. The nights, uh, waking up in the night because there was screaming going on in the, in a, either in our room or in the room next door and trying to put them back to sleep or hearing about it and then trying to focus. I just think it were the years of Novak and the year of Rafa mm -hmm. and honestly to lose against them sometimes at that moment, but I also beat them sometimes in those moments, um, was totally acceptable. Uh, and from being maybe the dominator, I became the challenger and I liked that role as well and it made me change my game and I actually really stayed, uh, stayed hungry throughout. Then I had um, a setback in 16 with my knee when I actually ran a bath for my girls and I go over to run the bath and my knee goes click and I tear the meniscus and I have to do the <laughs> surgery after. So that was the beginning, you know, so it was running a bath for the girls. But yeah, I'm happy it happened. Look, um, it's part of the, the journey and but, it's all good. You, you know, know what? I, I don't know if you're like, <laughs> not all professional athletes would prioritize their family and say, we're all going on the road together. Oh, it was the only way. I said, I never would I go on the road without my kids and then, then I'd rather retire. And then, I, then I would have had to retire 10 years ago. For me, it was always clear with Mirka, we try it, we try it all together, or then we let it be. And um, that's where I can thank her as well in a big way to make it all uh, happen. What has she meant to you? She has gone She's to almost all of your 1,500 matches yeah. and watched and been there, even yeah, pregnant. Yeah, I met my wife uh, when I was uh, just over 18 at the Sydney Olympics in 2000. She was also part of the Swiss uh, tennis team there. And uh, we hung out for 10 days and, you know, fell in love there. And so she's been really part of the whole journey. And she always uh, taught me also to be interested in more than just tennis, you know. And I think that was from the beginning really an eye opener as well. And not just to be focused on just the next forehand or the next tournament, but everything that goes into it, you know. And she was really able to keep incredible uh, friendships alive while being on the road and uh, have my back throughout that journey. And uh, uh, she's meant uh, everything to me. She's got a wonderful relationship with my parents who have been the most wonderful parents as well. So. Everyone marvels that your parents raised you. They encouraged your tennis, but they didn't put a ton of pressure on you. How did they pull that off? 
I guess they had a good balance and I must have also loved the game. They just didn't like it when they would go on weekends for tennis tournaments and I would behave like a brat on the court and shout and scream and commentate and throw rackets and be unprofessional and not having my drinks ready or whatever it was. People can't believe this about you because yeah, you're like, but... now you're like Spock. <laughs> You're, you're cool under pressure. My whole generation of friends, we were all the same. We were all insanely crazy at the time. And my dad and my mom, they would be so fed up and disappointed me. So I just think, especially once I went more professional, I always felt they had a, a really healthy distance to me and the game. They always let the coaches do their stuff, my fitness coaches, and they would just check in with me, how are things going? Everything's good on my side, okay. They would check in on the other side. So I think, honestly, um, they were perfect parents for for somebody like me I mean it's funny because a lot of people do think like your generation is Djokovic and Nadal and mm -hmm. Federer but your generation is also Agassi and Sampras yeah. and Andy Roddick which speaks right. to your longevity yeah that's true yeah I guess I was also a little bit the bridge I guess between the older generation and then this generation that we see I do miss that other generation of the Sampras and Agassi's and Rafa's coach Moya and Tim Henman and everybody. Um, those were my almost my favorite years. Mm -hmm. Of course, then it was the family years, but those beginning years were just insane. Being able to share the locker rooms with my heroes and idols, and it was uh, like a kid in a candy shop. You and Rafa have been fierce rivals on the court, but astonishingly, you have become friends, mm -hmm. genuine friends. How does a rivalry become a friendship like that? I think through respect, you know, and I think also his, his family is wonderful and I think um, both families respect each other a lot, my parents, his parents, uh, um, both teams, uh, yes it got heated and it was intense in certain moments, uh, but I think overall always me and Rafa, we were always to, able to keep a, a cool head throughout. Um, I saw also Rafa coming through the rankings, you know, I lost to him in 2004, I believe in Miami, he was only maybe just 17, I was world number one at the time and he beat me and I could see like a superstar rising right in front of me you know and uh, and in the in, in the beginning he was very interesting and he was very very shy you know and you used to always say like well whatever Roger wants is the right thing anyway um, because he's great and then as he was getting older he wanted it his way sometimes in certain whatever it was and I like to see Rafa growing into the man he is today and did you get to talk to him before your announcement and I did and share uh, with him? yeah I called him up uh, you know uh, probably a week before the announcement and I just told him it's it's coming it's real because I know I can trust him it would never come out with him and uh, uh, yeah I, I'm uh, I mean you would have to ask him you know how he felt when I told him but uh, it wasn't easy One beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. So what do you, how do you envision life now? Could you do some TV commentating? <laughs> maybe. I mean, I, would, I couldn't be away from home too long, or, uh, but maybe some select matches or some select tournaments. Why not? Uh, I think I have a lot to say, maybe add to the game, and I always uh, thought it's wonderful to see, you know, the Chrissy Evers, the Johnny Max, and all the great other 
players tell a great story and they make it more entertaining. I don't know if I would be good at it, but maybe it'd be interesting, you know. So I'll have to give it, give it some about, thought. Would you coach? A lot of former players go Co coach. Yeah, co coaching would be difficult probably because yeah. I feel to really have an impact with a player, you need to spend at least a good solid 20 to 35 weeks a year. Yeah. I don't know if I can go on the road. I don't want to. Yeah. I just I want to be here for my children. Um, and I, I'm still an ambassador for a lot of the brands. Um, I have a foundation, you know, that's really important to me. I'm, I, li I love my business as well, you know, I, I own parts of uh, On Running, which is a wonderful company, Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, company. So I can go there to the lab all the time and also design and, you know, that's my passion as well and work on sneakers. So um, I'm, I'm still very busy, you know, yeah. so I'm not like looking and fishing for any jobs, you know, but uh, staying involved and mentoring other players, of course, I, I could imagine that, but more probably in Switzerland, yeah. You often talk about the ball boy from Basel, mm -hmm. Switzerland. What, did this all just exceed even his biggest dream? Of course, of course. You know, I um, in our um, local club, they had uh, a women's tournament. It was my first time I was a ball kid. You know, I was very young. And then I became a ball kid at the hometown tournament in Basel uh, that I then ended up, was my last title actually. I ended up winning 10 times and played Agassi when uh, he was on his comeback. And I always thought, uh, having had that experience as a ball kid and then also thinking how cool it is to have a ball kid, yeah. not having to pick up your own <laughs> tennis balls is quite the luxury. And I always thought I uh, need to show them respect and um, the ball kids are going to be very special for me on this last tournament. Can you channel it? Can you like, can you connect with that little kid? Yeah. Can you imagine yeah, whispering to so. him? Because, this is how it's going to turn out. Yeah, because I used to chase uh, the tennis players at, the, at those events for autographs as well. Um, I can imagine that if you are an avid tennis player and you want to become a great player and you are a ball kid, before you go into sleep, you see yourself with a trophy, you know, and I, I had that and uh, it's probably ignited the fire for me too. But you ended up with 20 trophies. Yes, that is not a thing I expected, you know. <laughs> I mean, people told me I was talented in, in my city or in my community or then later on in my country, but internationally like this to, to break records, to go out and do incredible things, uh, definitely exceeded. I always said I never dreamt this far in my dreams. Should anyone be holding holding out hope for the next generation? Do the do the little Federers, any of your kids? Oh my love my kids! It, I thought you racket. were talking. Oh wait, wait, I thought you were just talking about the game itself. So the game itself will always be fine because yeah. the game is bigger than any player, yes. and we are very lucky in our sport to have unbelievable highlights. Yeah. We have so many cool tournaments. My kids, maybe one can do it. Uh, <laughs> My son, I have the feeling he has the most passion for, the, for tennis, but um, I'm not super pushy, but I feel like they're eight now. So maybe there I have to at least uh, give them the opportunity to shine if he wants to. So uh, at least now I got time, so I'll be his super coach if he wants me to be. I was going to say, that's who you have time to coach. <laughs> but you know, the girls told me once a funny story. I mean, told me a funny story. I told them, look, on the forehand, do this. This was also probably also eight years ago or something and they're like no 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 uh, our coach told us to do it like this I'm like aha uh -huh, okay fine if he knows better then do that you know <laughs> no respect <laughs> yeah no respect we're sitting right here where in a few days mm -hmm. you will be here and tennis greats from past and present will be here mm -hmm. and they will be applauding you yeah does that seem like a pretty good fairy tale ending? Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be emotional, I'm sure. But again, I'm not leaving forever. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like the last time you've seen me or I've seen uh, tennis courts. So, um, but of course, I know it's very special and unique in many ways for me. And it should be. And that's why I'm here and take it all in and show that I'm still here, uh, that I loved everything about it and I will miss it all. And I can't thank the crowds enough. So I just think by, by showing up uh, alone, um, I hope it's going to be very nice. There's a story that when you beat Andre Agassi, someone came up to him and said, oh, you'll get him next time. And Agassi said, no, <laughs> he, he changed the game. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's been a wonderful guy. Do you Andre. think you did? Do you feel that know. legacy? I hope I was part of it. I feel like we pushed the tennis into the right direction um, and tennis will be pushed further into another atmosphere that we don't think possible yet, you know, um, but I'm happy 
I was able to probably have some something to do with it, you know. And I think I did it my way. I always stay true to myself, and um, people always. It seemed like loved watching me play, which is, I guess, the ultimate compliment. We did. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I won't let her throw her life away. We need to trick her into dumping him. As much as this will pain us both, we have to call a truce to make this work. You have to be in lockstep. Hey! Did you make a pact to not murder each other until you murder me first? We are here for you, my love. Yes, we're in lockstep. Yeah. Ticket to Paradise is Julia and George's first romantic comedy together and their sixth collaboration. You clean up pretty good. It's a friendship that has spanned two decades. So you guys, when you say you're friends, it's more than friends, really. I mean, you have a lot of friends in Hollywood, mm -hmm. I'm sure, but this is this sounds like it's definitely next level. Well, we've been friends a long time. Yeah, I mean, a long time. She, she comes over to the house in Italy with the kids and stuff, and we've had, I mean, you know, we've been together, we've worked together a lot. Yeah. I got to produce a film that she was nominated for an Oscar <gasps> for. And, oh, I was in the first movie he directed. Yeah, how how is that being directed by George Clooney? Yeah, come on, how is that? <laughs> You know, it's interesting oh, because, <laughs> no, I'm going to say this. I remember something so clearly because it's like, there's, I think it's the, my opening scene and I'm sitting in a, a booth at a restaurant and oh, yeah. I have this big hat on mm -hmm. and red lipstick. He was very specific. Mm -hmm. I loved how specific he was and clear. I mean, that's what an actor wants more than anything mm -hmm. is just like a clear, understanding mm -hmm. with the director of what they want and what is expected. Mm -hmm. And and he just would see me as just an actor when mm -hmm. we were at work oh. and talk to me as an actor and have these expectations and it wasn't it wasn't that same like just casual, right. oh, hey, Jules, why don't you do this? It was like, okay, I want this to be just like this. Wow. And, you know, and it was really, it was really special. Was and fun. I also, that it was his first movie and that I got to be a little part of it, I felt. It was fun. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it really. It was, we had a really good time. We did have a good time. Um, this whole movie, obviously, is a movie about parents who are upset that their daughter is marrying someone who they don't think is right for her. Um, and before it's, they even meet him. Before they even meet him. Say. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was too fast, too far away. Like, I was, uh, I was feeling the parents in the beginning. When you saw the script, were you like, we, this is us? We both said, well, if, if you do it, I'll do it. Because mm -hmm. it's sort of the... Oh, it, these, really the only way you could see it working. But it was, I mean, it's a miracle that it all came together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, best part about working with Julia Roberts on this movie, go. <sighs> the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I will, I will be honest, which I don't yeah. like doing. I, he doesn't, and I don't like when you are honest. You don't like it, because I'm, I'm nice sometimes, and that's a terrible. Throws uh, me. She's a great friend, and she mm. is, you know, on top of all of the things that we all know she is and everyone knows she is, she also is a very, very good friend. And so it's really fun to work with people that, uh, that are truly good friends. And uh, Julia, best part of working with, uh, with George on this movie. Now, I've cornered you now. Yeah, I know, you have cornered me. I'm going to say this, because George and I, um, we have, I don't like to say that we're very much alike, but we do have the same, like... Beard. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have here? <laughs> We're gonna get like three and a half questions out. Um, we have the same energetic spirit yes. at home mm -hmm. and not, I said that, like we live together. We do live together, which is a very weird for my wife and Danny. <laughs> but at work, we both really like a joyful, exuberant yeah. work experience. And we, we take that sort of leadership very seriously mm -hmm. in a way to be to be relaxed to make other people relaxed yeah. and and happy and so being together on set is such a in a way it's a continuation of our of our real life together yeah. which is just singing songs and carrying on and i don't know how y'all didn't crack up through each take i mean i watch you two and the banter seems like it's happening in that moment you learned that to make me look bad you don't need my help there. Uh, 
Are you all ad-libbing some of that, or is it all? Not much. Well, no, we, have a, we have a fair amount of ad-libbing, <laughs> especially in the drunken scenes. Yeah. But what it would be, too, is when they would put us with a group of people, like at the graduation, where oh, we sort disaster. of have an yeah. audience, oh, yeah. then we can't be stopped, because we're trying, we feel it's our responsibility to have to sit there all day to entertain them. And so we yeah. had a different searing joke at each other yeah. Yeah, there were time. There were a couple where, you know, you, you do it, and then we both stop and like go, is this the step too far? Is this too mean? And we finally ended our friendship. <laughs> This is what it looks and feels. From the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? What kind of training regimen? How you doing, Lester? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What was your first impression once you saw it all come together? I thought, you know, it just felt like a salve, oh. an hour and a half yeah. salve. I remember you saying to me though, when we saw it, and you go, you're so mean to me. I, I was shocked, actually. Really? I, was re I had yeah. forgotten how really, some of it was kind of searing. Ma'am, I need to sit somewhere else. I'm sorry, it's a full flight. We used to be married. The worst 19 years of my life. We were only married for five. I'm counting the recovery. And yeah. because I've gotten away from it and George hasn't said anything <laughs> mean to me in a week, I was like... I could do it now. <laughs> 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 well, there are the meanie parts, which are fun to watch, and there's also the kissing part. Is it awkward to kiss your dear, dear friend. <laughs> it is when my wife and kids come by to visit me. That Wait. was the first day they came to visit. It's like, Papa, oh, Auntie Juju. It's like, ah, get him out, get him <laughs> out. <laughs> it's really bad. What are you doing, Papa? What is that? <laughs> they didn't, they no, didn't they see they it. Were, they were the Who wants ice cream? <laughs> yeah. Do y'all laugh when you're kissing? Is it funny yeah. or is it, are you trying to? Yeah, we what? laughed. It was funny. Wait, Julia, it was yeah, it was. It's kind of ridiculous. I mean, yeah. because listen, you know, it is like kissing your best friend. And well, then, thanks for that. And then, you know, you know I was, a, you know, I was wait, a two times sexiest then man you go, alive. Wait, my best friend's George Clooney. Yeah, come Maybe on, I man. Better tune in a little bit, and but then you just can't. <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> Boy, you really, you really helped I'm my sorry. reputation. What about from your end? From my end? Yeah. Because yeah, I didn't really kiss from my end. I. <laughs> You we were doing it right on the lips. Um, Open that door, Hoda. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, no, it was fun. Look, I, you know, we knew what we were going to yeah. do. We knew what the job yeah. was, and yeah. it's funny. Yeah. We were very professional. But it does make you laugh. Guys. And that was the day, too, that it, the first time in my 30 years in show business, I had a 3.30 call. Never. 3.30 a.m.? Uh-huh. Is, that's when you get up every day, I know, isn't it? That's our yeah. speed. So okay. wait, what was it? This yeah. is not my speed. Yeah. And I'm an early riser. And yeah. I was like, 3.30, are you sure about this? Yeah. Because they wanted the sun Shut to up. be rising oh, while we were kissing. kissing and this whole thing. And so I think it was also a, a ploy of all's. He thought if we're exhausted, if he has us tired enough in that moment we that we around. might be serious. Yeah, he was wrong. It was beautiful. By the way, my favorite part of the so many great parts, but y'all with your drunky monkey dance. Dad, please stop doing that. Oh, yeah! Woo! People are looking! 
was I a thought 10 was some, plus. I thought, come on, I thought that was some good dancing, didn't you? Yes, I did. I mean, you know. I kind of did. I was kind of into it. Those were our moves, man. Uh, yeah. For real? Well, yeah. actually, well. if you think of it, like about 20 years ago when we were doing Oceans, uh, we had a party, remember, in, yes. in Vegas? Yes. Uh -huh. Pretty much the same moves. They were the same moves. To different effect, and yeah. we were actually drunk. <laughs> Y'all yeah. did look drunk in that yes. thing. It looked like you were really putting them down. Was there any ounce of those drinks that were actually real beverages? Uh, no. No. I've never done a, a, a film with Julia that I was sober. <laughs> I don't think ever, really. It's, it's hard, you know? We, They're like, you're going to kiss Julia. <laughs> Just leave the bottle. <laughs> Just leave the bottle. Um, no, it, there was no drinking, although yeah. when we watched it, we, we thought we were. I was really impressed with how drunk and loopy and I, I think that was some of our best acting. Well, the young kids just were so, it was, they were shockingly yeah. embarrassed. The first take just, watching us, because all was like, okay, I'm not even going to pretend to tell you guys what to do. Just, yeah, just stay watch. in this area. Yeah. And, uh, and we sort of took off and they were, like, the, they were stunned. They were paralyzed. We, and we thought we were really funny and they didn't. Remember they were just kind of staring at us like we were in the zoo and we were like, pretty funny, huh? And they're like, oh my God. Like, You're so like, you know they're rolling a camera on you guys, right? <laughs> Everybody's gonna see it. Dinosaur room. I am praying yeah. for an asteroid. They can see what it's like to get old and it's terrifying them, you know? <laughs>
mm. hilariousness, especially yeah. Alexander. And, but if, if, if I speak Italian and George speaks English and you're one of George's kids, they will speak in Italian and then speak in English and then speak in Italian and then speak in English and right. go back and forth. And it's like, wait a minute. Do you speak all those languages? No. <laughs> it's a disaster. Every time they, and, and they talk to each other in Italian when I'm talking to them, I'm like, what do you, what? What'd you say? So you know it's a conspiracy. And it's a twin thing anyway. Yeah. Like aside from this, the language thing, oh, it's, it's a twin it's, thing. This has been a disaster for what's happened to me. Do you know you are sitting next to a man <laughs> who has never been in, in an argument with his wife? Mm. Well, I've is been that, in wait. an argument with you, though. So yeah, it all works out. <laughs> his but, work wife. <laughs> but is, do you find that like shocking? No, you don't. I don't. How, you tell guys me. don't fight because I don't fight with you my husband. You don't fight either. with your husband no. either. They don't fight. How do you resolve conflicts? Like, how do we you... just don't fight? It's just not how we communicate with each other. It's not. Yeah. It's never been your language called for. It has never been our language. But you just have ways of resolving conflicts, and you ask through just regular conversation and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know. Well, I also think, you know, every once in a while, luck plays in a, a part in all yeah. this, you know? I feel very lucky that I met Amal, and I feel very lucky, sort of late in life for me, that, uh, you know, the things that you used to as a young person, you know, guys in particular, I think you would defend in a way that you don't have to when you're older. You know, I know how lucky I am to be with Amal, so mm. if we're gonna paint the wall yellow, uh, and I think it's a really dumb color. Who cares? Who cares? And when you're 28, you might, and you you want to fight about those. Things. So so many things in life that I think when you're young you would fight about. You know, when you get old like Julia, um, <laughs> you don't fight so much. <laughs> I think having kids. I mean, I have obviously kids later in life too. I've got a five and a three year old. Yeah. I feel like I'm a different parent than I would have been. I feel like I am, um, I feel like I'm just a better person. I get scared sometimes if I'm being totally honest about mm. being my age. You do. And sometimes I get afraid about what's ahead. Like sometimes when I think about milestones, I just hold my breath and think, please God, like let me, I wanna, I wanna witness that. Yeah. I wanna see that. Do you ever have those? No, I things? kind of like the idea of being sort of out of it when like <laughs> my daughter starts to date. I'd like it to be like, huh? <laughs> I think I'm be comfortable with that. I really do. Stop, I want you to meet me. He's a drummer in a band. I like toast. I like toast. I'm okay with that. Um, no, I think, but here's the thing. The Tell truth me. is, because yeah. we all, no matter how old we are, George mm -hmm. being the oldest of us, um, it doesn't, you know, they have chosen us in this oh. moment to be their stewards and their shepherds in this life experience. And, you know, it all happens when we're ready. I met Danny when I was ready. You met them all when you were ready. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then we call these children into our lives when we're ready to best partner with them. And so I don't, I mean, sometimes I get gripped with fear mm -hmm. of blowing it. And sometimes I've just said to my kids, like, so today, me as a mom, can we just can we just take that off the board? Because yeah. I, I blew it. Yeah. You know, Bono would talk about his kids, and he said, you know, I had a conversation with him once where he said, you know, they're like 15. And yeah. he said, now we're about to get to the age where you're just going to, for no reason at all, hate me. <laughs> you're going to hate me for like five years. Yeah. I'm just going to you're just gonna be against me. And he goes, and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna think I'm kinda of cool and we're gonna mm -hmm. get along really mm -hmm. well and we're gonna have a great life. He goes, can we just skip those <laughs> The middle years? part. I, I like know. that idea. I do too. I think there are so many parts, I mean, I wanna dwell on parenting, but I'm just kind of in the middle of it and since I'm sitting with both you guys, I feel like there are certain, I have certain things I try to teach my kids and one of them is when they don't know something or they feel stupid, instead of saying, either ignoring it or, or saying, being embarrassed about it, mm -hmm. I, we have something that we say and it is, I guess I haven't learned that yet. Ah, and that's nice. Yeah, Very good. I just—it's like a small thing, mm -hmm. but little bits and pieces. Are there things that you've tried to teach your kids that you hope that they will carry with them as they like head off to into the world, into college? Well, I mean, <clears throat> my kids are a little older, yeah. and I mm -hmm. feel like the one thing that we've always tried to instill in them is to just remember who you are when you're out in the world. Mm. Remember that you 
as one person or representing five people mm -hmm. and just to conduct yourself in that mm -hmm. same way that you would when we're all together mm -hmm. when you're by yourself out in the world. So, and I think that's, not only does it make you feel like you're not so all alone out mm -hmm. in the world, it does kind of remind you to just be that much more thoughtful mm -hmm. or that much more helpful mm -hmm. if you can be. Beautiful. Nice. George, about for you? I guess I haven't learned that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. I was waiting ah! for it. Oh, I love that you did it. <laughs> okay. You're going to tee it up for me. I'm going to take <laughs> oh, I love this friendship so much. Okay, so we looked up your zodiac signs. You're a Taurus, you're yes. a Scorpio. Okay, so here's what it says. They're really weak signs. <laughs> <laughs> they are opposite signs in the zodiac, giving them a special complex connection. Mm. They can combine to make a whole, each partner's strength balancing the other's quiet, weaknesses. Quiet, quiet, okay. quiet. <laughs> Taurus, and Scor <laughs> Taurus and Scorpio have tons in common, but because their personalities are both so powerful, mm -hmm. they often swing between passionate love and passionate disagreement. Mm. Do you huh. think, is there any truth to that? There was till the end. I don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't no, disagree. We, disagree. we, the only things we disagree on is one for the road. <laughs> no, one time I got up, I had to leave <laughs> dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you going to tell? I don't know no, what story No, one time I had to leave dinner because I had to work the next yeah. day. Yeah. And we're all sitting there at dinner and we we're having a beautiful dinner and drinks and having this great time. And I said, I'm so sorry, I really have to leave. And I get up at this nice restaurant and I start walking out and George goes, Quitter. <laughs> Julia Roberts is a quitter. <laughs> yeah, you gotta throw her under the bus every once in a while. Yeah. You know, somebody uh, has to throw her under the bus. Everybody's like, oh, Julia. You know, so no. that would that's be, what you do. Those are our disagreements. I love that. Do y'all think you'll be working again at together in movie? <laughs> it's not gonna happen. I've learned my lesson. You know, it took five or six times, but I've learned. You yeah, know, no. No, no. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's put me in his contract. He can't live without me on screen. Uh, of course yeah. not. Yeah, why not? She's also the best available, you know, really. <laughs> available. I love you guys so it's much. Thank you. you. It's so take fun a nap to, now. I know. It's fun to watch. <laughs> we wear you out. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> this is what it looks and feels like. the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. movies are just now being rolled out. Among the first is the romantic comedy Notting Hill. It tells the story of an unlikely romance between the world's most famous actress, played by Julia Roberts, of course, and a shy London bookseller, played by Hugh Grant. The thing that is so irritating is that now I'm so totally fierce when it comes to nudity clauses. You actually have clauses in your contract about nudity? Definitely. You may show the dent of the top of the artist's buttocks, but neither cheek. Or if there's a stunt bottom being used, artist must have full consultation. You have a stunt bottom? Well, I could have a stunt bottom, yes. Wow, and are people tempted to go for better bottoms than their own? Yeah, I mean, I would. Julia Roberts, good morning. Nice to see you Thank again. You. Welcome Thank back. You. Thank you. Gee, what original question could I ask you? You play a world-famous movie star, Anna Scott. Could you relate to her? I'm kidding. <laughs> 
for Julia. People don't realize we just had this conversation. We were chatting <laughs> yeah. about this. Well, people don't probably realize that you've been asked over and over again about the parallels between mm -hmm. this woman you play, who's gracing every magazine cover in the world, mm -hmm. and your real life. Yeah. Um, when you were first approached about this, I understand you thought the idea stunk. Mm -hmm. And then as you read the script, you thought, I could really do this. What was it about the script that make, made you think you could take the plunge? Well, because I felt that the story was so beautifully constructed and I felt that really the idea of her being a um, famous actor was just a great contrivance to show real extremes of people's lives and, and how to make things that are so drastically different work. Because I think these two characters are different on so many levels, culturally and just sort of their upbringing and all that, separate and apart from their jobs. They really are. I mean, she's yeah. like the princess of popular culture. He hasn't heard of anything. I mean, he's been basically living under a rock. A few of the things I was like, oh, come on, you've heard of that. But he really is sort of disengaged from what's going on in the world. Yeah. But I just loved it. I loved it. And Richard Curtis is a brilliant writer. And he really constructed a story that I just felt I wanted to participate in telling. He wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral, mm -hmm. right? And, and a lot of the movie really is sort of um, ensemble acting. Mm -hmm. Was that fun for you, working with these actors? Well, it was fun. It was um, a daunting, in a way, because we'd all be you know, sitting around this table and I'm telling you, English people can say anything and sound clever, charming, and, <laughs> and just so smart. Right. And then I would sort of open my nasal mouth and be like, what are you talking about, you know? <laughs> and every time I get my heart broken, the newspapers splash it about as though it's entertainment. <laughs> and it's taken two rather painful uh, operations to get me looking like this. Really? Mm. Really? Mm. <laughs> no, nice try, gorgeous, but you don't fool anyone. <laughs> Just to sit there at that table and sort of watch them each have their shining moment was so exciting as an actor just to witness. There is sort of a moment of truth there about celebrity, and I'm sure you've been talking about this ad nauseum and about some of the downsides of, of celebrity status. Mm -hmm. um, do you think a lot of people, though, will see this movie, and obviously Anna Scott is experiencing the downside of, of being famous, but they might kind of say, <laughs> boo-hoo? Well, I kind of said boo-hoo to her. Um, but at a certain point, you have to realize that she's doing the best that she can. And if the best that she can do is to be a little whiny or to not take the highest road with the situation, that's OK. I mean, it's not my place. It's not, it, it's just not anyone's place to judge her experience. Because I think where she's at in her life, she hasn't really come to terms with how famous she is or the opportunities that she's given. And I think by the end of the movie, she's really getting there. But it also is true that while most famous people wouldn't trade it, there are things about it that are really difficult at times without sounding whiny. Yeah, there are things that are more challenging than other things and things that test the patience more than other things. But all workable, all achievable, all, you know, I had someone say to me the other night at the premiere, I'm dressed to the teeth, I'm there with my man, I, my hair looks fabulous. And she said, <laughs> could you tell us about the downside of fame? I said, baby, look at me. You see a downside? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And it really is all about the way you choose to view it. You're doing another movie with Richard Gere. I'm sure that every person in America has asked you this as well, but it's called Runaway Bride. Mm -hmm. It is not Pretty Woman 2, but it really is just teaming up the two of you again, and Gary Marshall mm -hmm. as well. Are you happy with it? Well, I haven't seen it, um, but we sure had a lot of fun making it. Was it like the old days? or? Well, no, because the difference between being 20 and being 30 is vast. <laughs> I'm like a different person now. And so it was really interesting on a Freudian level where I've become very kind of the pop psychologist, you know. <laughs> so on that level, I was fascinated at every turn. And it was nice because we had um, 
some of the same cast that we had in Pretty Woman came in and did things for us. Hector right, the Elizondo. Guy, the guy from the Ginkgo Bell Biloba <laughs> commercials now. I love him. Oh, Hector. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He's always talking about Ginkgo Biloba now. He's but also anyway. on Chicago Hope. I know. He, I, I know. <laughs> More important. Nice. We digress. <laughs> <laughs> the movie's called Not Email. Julia Roberts, it's really fun talking to you. And we'll be back in a moment. Julia and I are going shopping, though. <laughs> Listen, without giving away too much, mm -hmm. and I know you won't, what, what, is, what is NOPE about? It's about a lot of things. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the first notion that uh, I latched onto when I was writing this movie was this idea of, of making a spectacle, making something people would have to see. Right here, you are gonna witness an absolute spectacle. So what happens next? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Here we go. And and I, I felt like I was uh, I was fighting for cinema. I was fighting for the theater theatrical experience when I was writing this film. So it's about spectacle. And from there, I, I, I explored that and started to sort of uncover what I think is like the dark side of our relationship with spectacle. You could make the argument, I watched it last night, you could make the argument that the film, at least on its face, seems to be about this idea that spectacle can consume us, does consume us, quite literally in, in some cases. Is, is that part of, of what we were going for? I mean, we are, <laughs> I like what you did. The, it, look, this is a society of the spectacle. And I think that uh, the, the, the idea of spectacle um, harms us in many ways, whether it's something we are so obsessed by that we, um, we give it too much power because it's, uh, it has a spect spectacular nature to it, or if it's because we use the spectacle to distract the, ourselves from the truth. We have this very, uh, very uh, dark relationship with it. And I, I, I think about bottlenecking, right? When we're, when we're driving, when we're in traffic and there's an accident, and that traffic slows down. Yeah. It's because everybody's sneaking a peek at that awful spectacle and it's slowing everybody down. And so that, I latched onto that and said, let's make a movie about that. This would be an opportunity. I'm talking rich and famous for life. There's plenty of videos for flying online. Ain't nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? We gonna get. The money shot. It's about human nature. Yeah. All my films are about human nature and about something that um, I fear is part of our DNA and, and scares me. And it's something that I share with us, but I, I, I feel like it, it hasn't been sort of pinpointed yet. I, I read uh, in an interview recently that, that you, you maintain this is not a film that could have been made five years ago. Why not? Uh, I think there's, you know, a, a lot of reasons. You know, I think from a, a, a from, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, representation, I think this idea of, you know, letting a black director um, put his vision into a, a film and commit to it, and, and into a, you know, a fly, the Great American Flying Saucer film. Um, you know, I, I let's just let's put it this way: five years ago, I didn't think they would ever let me do that. And so I, uh, and then even you know, on the on the technological front, yeah. you know, I worked with cinematographer Hoyt von Hoytema, um, who is absolute legend, and and some of the techniques we developed on this to achieve spectacle have never been attempted before and um and so I, i'm just very proud of what we pulled off in that way. a couple times i'm watching i'm i'm thinking this is expensive <laughs> this this is this is really expensive they gave jordan peele the checkbook and they're like go do what you want hey you know <laughs> yeah i mean look that i 
I, that, that's an, another piece of this puzzle is that, you know, so much of my uh, career before I became a director was, you know, marred with this, um, this uh, internalized sense that I could never be allowed to do that, that no one would ever trust me with, the, with money, uh, in, you know, enough money to do my, to do my vision, yeah. the way they would trust other people. I, just, I felt that that was true. And so here I am, Universal Studios, they, they've proven me wrong. Get Out, the, the social commentary on, on, on race is, is obvious. Um, with this is wait. We have to wait for the um, the tram to go by. Yes, these which are is, folks by the, who are going to be coming to see. This is monumental. This is what I'm about. This is what it's about right here. We that, should right now. Them over. They think that I am. Jordan Peel. Yeah, Mr. Peel. It's, it's his set. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. They'll come back next week. They come, yeah, they'll think I'm I'm an animatronic <laughs> that's just here, and they'll come back. So get out, obviously. I mean, the social commentary there on, on, on race is it's pretty obvious. Do you find the being African-American has more advantage or disadvantage in the modern world? <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. And I think you can make the argument that, that us is sort of about uh, what human beings, like what we're capable of, the sinister mm -hmm. nature of, of our behavior. This doesn't seem to be as much about race. Is that is that by design? Yeah, you know, it's certainly not as much about Get Out, where, you know, the very fabric of the plot um, um, machinations were about, you know, this racial dynamic. You know, I, I feel like it's impossible to make a mo movie with um, people of color in it and have it not be about race. I mean, hell, I think it's impossible to make a, a, any movie without it being about race because, you know, race is all around us. You know, I think what, what is interesting and, and sort of where the, the notion of nope and the title came from, which on one hand is, you know, something that black people recognize as our point of view in horror situations, is this acknowledgement that of this thing we're talking about, where this is, this, you can't have black people in a flying saucer film and just have it be the same experience. It's just, it's not, there's a, there's a different r relationship. No, 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 no. And this film is, is also, which is, takes place uh, in the outskirts of uh, Hollywood or the, um, you know, the, the industry of the spectacle, um, you know, is also so wrapped up with this idea of, um, uh, representation and erasure, which, you know, those, theme, those themes are in there, but to your point, um, it, it, it's, an, it, it's an adventure and a horror spectacle about, about human nature. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is what it looks and feels. The storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I think, you know, as we talk about spectacles, you know, it becomes abundantly clear that all the, the themes and characters in this movie interact or represent the media in some way. 
and uh, or some faction of mm -hmm. it. And uh, obviously, the nucleus of the media I'm sort of examining here is is, is Hollywood. Mm -hmm. it, and uh, the selling of, of dreams, the selling of nightmares, the selling of illusion um, is, uh, is, is that, that's in the cornerstone of the piece. But it's not just an indictment of Hollywood. I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple moments in the film where it's sort of an indictment of, of, of us, yeah. of, of, of journalism. Yeah, yeah, any, 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 any time we're, that we're going to make money yeah. off of the human need to see something crazy. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is what I, what I call spectacleization. God. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a guilty ma party. Yeah. You're a guilty party. Um, we we, we kind of all are yeah. in some ways, whether, what, whatever side we're all on, on it. And that's kind of the point. We are, by the way. Okay, here we go. This is a big deal. This is a... Because Jordan Peele yeah. has been memorialized Memorialized? Oh, that, the, oh, I mean, on does the that way, happen after? You've got Jaws, you've got just, Back to the Future. Yeah, but I'm You don't still, have a lot of sets. I just, but I mean, well, that's true. That's, that's, that's a good point. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, this is a big yeah, deal. This is good. This is, this is, this, this is your set. Uh huh. So, this, uh, if I can tell you about the, the, I would the, love the space, yeah. I know you saw the film, but uh, this is Jupiter's Claim, um, which is a, a theme park uh, owned by a former child star, a Ricky Juke Park played by Steven Yeun. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is in the vision of the movie a Kid Sheriff that he was in as a child in the mid-90s. I don't know if you remember that film, Kid Sheriff. I, I do not. Know. Okay, well, well it's real. Um, and here we are. And, and obviously, um, you know, it, there, there's, there's more to meet the eye than here. So, you know, if you're going to, when you're going to see Nope. Yeah. So there, there is another layer um, to, to what happens here. You don't want to give away too much. Don't want to give away too much. But, uh, but you could make the argument that this is a centerpiece of, of the film, the Star Lasso experience. We won't tell folks exactly. We won't tell people what happened what there. What happened here. But um, something did happen there. Something did occur. And uh, yeah, here we are. No, I mean, look, you know it's a, a UFO movie. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, there's there is a you know something about this world that to, to juxtapose the sort of uncanny valley um, world of this of this um, th th this, um, this sort of mom and park theme park yeah. um, right in the middle of a uh, sort of UFO hotspot. Um, it was just the kind of juxtaposition that was it was very me. I thought if someone had said to you 10, 15, 20 years ago that Jordan Peele one of his films would 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 mm. have permanent space here on the lot at Universal. What would you have said? I would have said, well, then it would have worked. My plan would have worked. <laughs> this um, was part of the grand plan all along. I mean, yeah. Okay. You know, I don't. You know, I don't know if I knew to really dream this big, but I but I did. I did. I mean, when I, you know, when I first came to Universal Studios as a kid, I, I was very enamored with um, the, I was just very enamored with movie making and, and the idea of being in a space where people actually make movies. Yeah. And I, I just want to, and, and so, you know, to have a home on, on a, a lot, let alone this lot, is just very special to me. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what it looks and feels. From the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. 
Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Michael Abels, uh, he, of course, scored this one. He scored Get Out. Uh, he's, he scored us. I interviewed him a few months ago. I've been a fan of his work for a long time. And he told the story of, of when you called to invite him on that first project. He thought you were punking him. Uh, what, what, what is it about Michael and his style that has led you guys to work together so much? Well, it's so funny that he thought I was punking him because I, you know, I really, I had never directed a film when I first reached out to him on Get Out. And what, what I loved about his style is he, he has an ability to create new genres of, of music. And he can do it many times. You can sort of describe a new flavor of music and he can achieve that. They took him. They took him all. I gotta get out of this house. I'm trying to save you. My brother is out there. And uh, that's how I want my films to feel. I want it to feel like something you've never experienced. And so, <clears throat> you know, that, that's, that's what he does. He's like, he's like a, a, you know, he's like a Shaolin yeah. monk. You know? That's a great, I mean, and masterful. Just, I mean, the music last night, you know, not to give away too much, but I, I feel like when you watch and you listen to a Jordan Peele film now, you know and that it's a Jordan Peele film. Like that's become one of the uh, hallmarks of it. I love that. I it's love true. that. You know, it's, I spend a lot of time uh, just focusing on this responsibility of trying to be a, a mirror for what comes in, you know? And, um, and so to, to hear at the end people say that they, they are, can see me in there, in the cross section of these things, they sort of see me, I, I feel like, yeah, you, you do. Daniel Kaluuya, uh, you guys have become um, quite the dynamic duo. Uh, mm -hmm. We came to know him and, and get out. We see him again here. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about working with Daniel that, that makes it so special? Uh, Daniel, I, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. He's my favorite actor um, to watch and, and to work with as well. He, he, we have a, a, a special, I mean, I, I believe he has this with any director he has, has this with, but we have a, a, a shorthand that is just, it's just the dream as a director that you can have somebody and with very little words, it's like siblings, you know, very little words. We can come up to each, I can, we walk up after a scene, I can be like, you know that thing, but, mm, what, that, but, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's like one of those silent conversations yeah. and um, he's just, he's so committed, you know, he's so, so focused, such a professional. Um, yeah, man, that's my, that's my uh, star. I want to talk about something. I want to ask you whether something informs your work and if so, how, how it does. You are a, a biracial man in America, white mom, black father. And, and some of the themes that we've seen emerge in your films, it would seem from the outside, it, it would seem to be that that, that worldview informs your movie making in a, in a somewhat pronounced way. Is, is that accurate? And if so, how? You know, I mean, my, my race, I think, has informed my entire artistic <laughs> uh, journey. And, and part of it has been trying to reconcile um, the box and the boxes that um, this, the country um, puts people of color in and trying to break out of that box, what, what, those boxes, whatever, and trying to identify, what does this mean? What, you know, what, what? And so I think from an early on, you know, you see this pattern in my work, it is about, um, 
digging into d digging into those boxes so I can shed them and break 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 out of them. And so you know, ever you know, ever since I kind of started on that mission, I got into this pattern of just like, look, if I see a box, I'm gonna break it. If I see something I'm not supposed to do, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm gonna figure out how to make it work. When people leave the theater after they see this, this film, what do you want them to be thinking about? Not to think, but what do you want them to be thinking about? Mm. I mean, that's a great question. I, uh, you know, I mean, this is their turn. This is their time for their end of the conversation. You know, I think if I if I had too clear of an idea of what I wanted them to be thinking about, um, I think I I I I feel like I wouldn't be having the, the conversation with the audience. You know, that's up to them. I want to hear. I want to know what they like. I said I I I feel like with Nope, we uh, you know we we described a, a feeling. And we portrayed a feeling, and we brought a sense of magic and adventure out of what was a very dark place and and very dark time. And um, so I, I I hope that they are, I hope they're just fulfilled yeah. and, and glad they went out to see it at an IMAX. Which, by the way, IMAX. You used IMAX cameras for this, I read. Oh yeah, we used IMAX cameras. Again, very expensive. Oh, very expensive <laughs> stuff. You can't, just, you know, but it makes it, it. It's I think it's the best way to watch the film. Yeah. Um, and the you know the, the the format is just immersive. It is the whole thing with me is like, I wanted to make a flying saucer movie, because I just felt like if we can feel like we are in the presence of something, other, something, if we feel like that's real, then that's just an immersive experience worthy of, of going to the movies. When Get Out it came out, I read that the, at the time you said you had three or four more films like that, in the, of the horror genre. You had three of those, four of those, you had them in your pocket. But as you sit here now, you 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 say there 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 are more. So you weren't supposed to say. It. Oh, you were oh, saying, no, oh. Yeah. <laughs> did I, did I <laughs> give it away? Oh no, no, you good, you good. <laughs> Look, I've got more. I, I'm not gonna have just one more film. Okay. I've got more now. No, of, it's of the horror genre. You know, it, it, it's funny. You you bring up the horror genre. I would say yes because I'm always gonna be having you know scary things yeah. in my film. But I do like this. You know, uh, I I do like expanding. I, I like working with the comedy. I like working with the adventure. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, genre is a thing to subvert. You like to bend the genre. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because there were a few times last night where I thought, yeah, this is, this is, this is funny. This is thrilling. This is, do you consider this a horror film? Well, like I said, I, you know, I think it's, it's no. I, I, I do consider it a horror film in that horror is, it's my favorite genre, and I, I hope it, 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 it honors horror. I hope it's scary enough yeah. to um, make people say, talking about nope. Um, you know, at the same time, I, uh, yeah, I want, I want people to feel some other things besides fear as well. Let's put it that way. This is what it looks and feels like. The storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? <laughs> for breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. 
back. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's hard to believe Kiki Palmer is only 28 years old since her acting debut in Barber Shop 2 nearly 20 years ago. Kiki has appeared in more than 60 TV shows and movies. Kiki starring in Jordan Peele's thriller Nope. She plays Emerald, who may have captured footage of a <laughs> UFO, which she and her brother are hoping to cash in on. Take a look. We don't just go for the quick cash in, okay? We, we go to the most credible platform to do the story. What's that, like Oprah? Yeah, like Oprah, for example. After that, everybody want in. But I'm saying there's plenty of videos of flying online. I saw one the other day that wasn't on Oprah. I didn't say Oprah. You said Oprah. You love Oprah. Like, all I'm saying is all that online is fake, low quality. Ain't nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? The shot. What shot? The shot. The money shot. Undeniable, singular, the, the Oprah shot. The Oprah shot? The Oprah shot. Come on out, Kiki. Ah, yes. Kiki. So good to We're see you so guys. We're so happy you're here. Oh Thank you for having Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Good to give a little French yeah. moment. Okay, first of all, you're looking beautiful. Shout out to wife, uh, Wayman Micah and Christopher John Rogers. Yes. He's such a talent and so are you. I got Thank to you. watch. Uh this this film which had me like both <sighs> terrified and also um laugh yeah laughing. yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, he, first of all jordan peele is a crazy talent yes. he is but you are effervescent in this oh you shine gosh. so bright what did it feel like to be part of it thank you so much i mean it feels so much fun i mean obviously i'm a huge fan of jordan and this is like a different type of, of film that he's done before yeah. um the, the, the style yes. is just really unique uh, but there's always this big overwhelming message so for me i was just focused on making sure that I was able to, you know, do what I needed to do yeah. to get the story told. Yeah. Now, a lot of what's been pointed out about this film, it's that it's about what could be. How does this come out in this film? Oh, man, you know, I think that's the whole spectacle concept, right? right? Yeah. There's something that our, our, the two lead characters, myself and Daniel's brother and sister, they discover something in the sky. Yeah. And then they're on this journey, both for different reasons, of finding out what is it exactly. You know, Daniel's character, OJ, just is curious. And then my character's kind of like, what can we, how can we get ahead yeah. of this? How can mm -hmm. we exploit this? And through that journey, it's really just kind of more so an observation of how many of us in today's society are obsessed with outside things, yes. validation, exploiting, you know, yes. getting everything on footage, you know? Yeah. So, but let's be real. Kiki's in her backyard having a cocktail with her <laughs> homegirls, and she sees a UFO. <laughs> Who is Kiki calling first? Honey, aside from talking to the girls that I'm with, yeah. I'm calling my mama. You know I'm on the computer sharing on the line? Sharon, you'll never believe what I just seen. That's always what goes down. We have to talk about your mom. Uh, we have this picture of you all in front of the oh. Nope billboard somewhere. Oh my God. Hopefully. Oh, but also, it. I've read so much about how she sort of, there we are. Yeah. Like how she made you feel like you could do anything. Absolutely. My mother, uh, my family has, uh, they've been such a great support system for me. And my mom specifically, you know, she and I both were always on this kind of road together. You know, thick as thieves, yeah. uh, battling throughout every ups and downs of this industry. Yeah. And so just for us to continue to have these new moments, even after 20 years, I I think it just, it, we're just feeling so blessed. I read your glamour cover story, which was so oh, profound, because you beautiful. talked about saying no. Yeah. And the power of it. And and we yeah. and also, like, that you feel comfortable now being like, listen, like, I'm going to put up my own boundaries. Yeah. Like, how does that, ch how does that change? I think it could just get hard for us, right? I mean, especially as a child entertainer, you yeah. just always want to be so agreeable. Yeah. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a part and of... And a woman. And, you know what I mean? I think it's a part of maturing and saying, it's okay to say, no, I can't do this. And it's, it's, it's like a big part of self love and also knowing that you can give your best you know yeah. what I'm saying yeah. like I think that's the way that I help myself transition to understanding that it's okay to say no is that at the end of the day all I want to do is do my best and if I'm giving too much and I'm spread too thin then how can I give yeah. my best yeah so that really made it easy for me to say just say no girl yeah but how do you like because I know a lot of actors in Hollywood think go into it like this could be the last job yeah. exactly and yeah. how do you get over that fear of like if you take a break that it's not gonna come back well I'll tell you I think it's just faith it's faith uh, you know and that 
that's something that we all are on our own personal journeys with, uh, whether it's a spiritual thing or just faith in yourself and to know that what's for me is truly for me. I remember there was something that Daniel said recently, I think it was a GQ uh, or an Essence that he was talking to about how he had you know, thought he was going to take a break from acting right before he did get out. Yeah. And he took that break and then he met with Jordan and yes. ended up doing Get Out. And, you know, so I think it's, again, everybody should follow their instincts and know that if it's time for you to take a break, take a break. Just know that what's for you is always going to yeah. be for you. Yes. yes. And do you feel like, I mean, you said in, in this article that you're sort of in this next phase of your life. Yeah. Where you want to be with your nephews and your nieces. And you're thinking about, like, your personal life in a way that you've never thought about it before. Absolutely. Because, again, I started so young. It kind of the only, it, it's like a kid that starts doing football, you know, or, yeah. or basketball. Yeah. This is all I care about. Yeah. But then as time goes on, you, you you get more interest. You think about love. You think about family. You yeah. think about, oh, I missed the graduation. Or I missed the, mm -hmm. my, you know, so you start. <laughs> don't, no, Kiki, don't get baby fever on those kids, okay? So it's so true that yeah. you start caring about things that you really didn't, you know, you didn't yes. look at before. And I think, again, it's about balance. Yes. I think that's what I want more than anything in my life, you know, is to have the balance of, of all the things I want. Yeah. Ooh, so you're going to show us a picture of that man <laughs> in the commercial break. <laughs> oh, my God. What you going to do, guys? Right? so <laughs> oh my much God. fun. This is our biggest problem on the show, backwards walking. Jenna? Yes? It's Jerry. Oh, Jerry, hi. Hi. Remember we said we were going to have coffee today? Oh, God. Am I late? What do you think? Okay, okay I'm on my way right now. Oh. I'm late. I'll be right there. Fantastic. Oh, lucky who's here. Hey. Hi. How are you? How are you? Don't hit your head. Mwah. Nice to see you. Thank you for meeting me for a little... Coffee? You're really uh, overdressed for just coffee. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> you I came straight elegant. from the show. Oh. But also, I knew there'd be pickles involved. Hi. Okay. Um, sure, I'd love a coffee. You too, I'd love a coffee. Okay, okay great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. you so, have you had a coffee already this morning? I've, I've had um, three coffees. <laughs> How many have you had? I've had one espresso. Every day starts with espresso. But it didn't always used it to. It didn't always. For years. I used to do jokes about it. I, oh, I thought... Coffee people were so weird. What is this drink you have to drink? Why? I can't talk until I've had my coffee. Why? Because <laughs> I just got up, yeah? <laughs> I feel tired when I get up. Yeah, we all do. So, okay, you didn't drink coffee, and yet you pitched a show. That well, I was drinking it at that point. That's, oh. what, that's where I got the idea for the show. I went, this is a fantastic drink. It gets people so chatty. This is great. Now, there's something that's, that must be open-minded about you, because to, to go from a no-coffee person to a coffee person takes, you know, I feel like most people stick in one lane. Yeah, I think I am pretty open-minded. I have done a lot of very weird, different things. <laughs> I have explored a lot of avenues in my journey to uh, perfect the human system. And have you perfected it? Pretty close. You look perfect. You look great. No, I, I feel like uh, I'm 68, and uh, I feel pretty good. To celebrate the 10th anniversary of Jerry Seinfeld's hit show, Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, he's releasing the Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee book, which takes readers behind the scenes of some of the most iconic episodes. Let's talk about this show and this book. I heard okay. that the most nervous you were, which kind of makes sense, was when you went to interview President Obama at the White House. Right. Your I'm, producer said you were a little scared. Yeah. Well, I felt like I was kind of representing every comedian that ever lived. Yes. And I was getting to do something that no comedian has ever done, which is do a little funny bit yeah. in the Oval Office. Yes. Which I don't think anyone's ever done. Did Dana Carvey never do that? Not in the real yeah. Oval Office. Yes. I don't think so. But it was a bit, you know, knocking on the window. Yes. And uh, sitting on the chair. And I heard that the Secret Service were the ones that told you to go knock on the window. I mean, you were behind the bushes and knocked on the window. No, I knew I was going to knock on the window. I had asked them. Is that They okay? said, could I... Do, I asked, I don't remember whose idea it yeah. was, but they said, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Were Which you, I couldn't believe they were going to let I me know. do that. Thank you. Thank and you. I thought, this is a great opportunity in the history of comedy 
you know, yes. to knock on the window of the Oval Office while the president's Thank working. Thank you. And also, there's lots of Secret Service yeah. that are hanging out there. Yeah. So it was a kind of a risk to your, to, <laughs> to your safety. Right? Why? Why would I be scared? Well, what of if them? one Secret Service man didn't know that Jerry Seinfeld was popping up behind the bushes knocking? I, I, I trust the Secret Service. This show is, you said, is kind of like a Valentine. Yes. Like a funny Valentine to yes. comedians. Yes. Why? You know, let me let me tell you what it what it's like to be a comedian. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's the greatest life if you can manage it. Yes. So the hard part is the comedian part. Yes. Making people laugh every night is hard. But if you have that, if you can do that, the, the rest of your life, you're with comedians. Yes. And this is, becomes a gigantic component of your life and is equally as enjoyable. <laughs> so I wanted people to see this other side. You know, I would say my life is 25% doing comedy. Yes. 75%. Hanging out with comedians. Hanging out with funny people. Yes. So you're constantly laughing. Yes. But I think, I guess what surprises surprises me about the show is that it is hilarious, which Thank people you. would expect, but it's also kind of human and mm -hmm. lovely and touching. There were moments where you want to kind of tear up, and I guess y'all are people, but that part, <laughs> that part surprised me. Well, we are people, but we're not normal people. We're, we're all, and what I have found is the gene is kind of the same, yeah. but it gets implanted in all these different types of people. But the essential gene, the comedy gene, is the same. And so it became a study of that or kind of an exploration of that. Look at all these different people that are all very different, and they all have this little thing, yeah. this little... Uh, I don't want to call it a defect, but uh, <laughs> it's a, let's call it an aspect. An aspect of their yeah. personality. Yeah. Do you remember when you knew you had that? I didn't, that I thought I was funny, you mean? You knew you were funny. Because you're not just that you thought you well, were funny. Well, I thought everyone was funny. As a little kid. When you're eight, everyone is funny. No, but not everybody is funny. You know what I mean? You can <laughs> think back to like the kids that are not funny. Yeah, there were some, but there were a lot of funny kids. Yes, that's true. Kids are funny. Right? right? And then something, it's like thir between 13 and 15 yes. is when it gets uh, slips away because the pressure yeah. of, oh, I've got to be a person now. Yeah, and you're embarrassed maybe. Yeah. Well, you... you Girls can be. You Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Be yes. embarrassed by that by part being of... Funny. By being funny. Well, being too big or something. Right. Too much personality. Did your friends think you were funny? Yeah. Do they still think you're funny? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And you, so like you're the funny one. I'm the funny one. That's great. But Barbara's pretty funny. If you yes, know my Barbara sister, is funny, she's yeah. funny, but right. I do like to make people laugh. I mean, what does it feel like to you to make people laugh? It's, it's the best thing in the world. It's a, it's a couple of seconds of weightlessness mm -hmm. where everything in your mind, everything you think about and worry about and work on your whole life is just gone for a second and it's and it lasts you know you feel you know if you have like a big laugh yes it lasts you know for a, the rest of the day you go that was so funny and it's you know? fun to see it in kids you know yeah. what I mean because I have a child who like we actually think is going to be the next Amy Schumer oh wow she's very wild and hilarious and will do anything for a laugh and when she gets an authentic one like to see that glimmer in their eye, to wow. see the glimmer. You know what I mean? There is something to it. Yeah. The trick is to not lose it. Yeah. You know, don't don't dismiss it. I think people people think, well, what what use is this? You know. Yeah, I wonder. Like in a world that feels pretty dark, you know, I think we can all be like, gosh, what what service are we unless we're doing more mm -hmm. but and I kind of used to be self-deprecating about my job sitting next to Hoda but I realized that I'm making people feel good yeah and that that is of service in some way in some small way it's not a small way it's not a small way it's a big way and do you feel that way too do you feel like you know what actually <laughs> making people laugh is something that's super important 
It is, yeah. I think I don't think of it kind of socially. I think of it in in the moment. Yeah. It's really important to me to get this laugh right now, because. Yeah. I don't know. You, you become, um, you kind of become a machine, in comedy. You just like, all day, every day, you're thinking about how do I get that joke to work. Yeah. And. I don't. Re I, I have a, a friend that always talks to me about this. He always says it's not. It is a bigger thing. You are providing a relief. Right. I always say the silly stuff we do. This, you know, it's it's meaningless. You know, he says no, it's extremely meaningful. So, it's a nice thought. Mm -hmm. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You'll get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get to sit with these hilarious people yes. and laugh, which I think making people laugh feels great, but also there's nothing better than laughing. So let's talk Steve Martin. <laughs> okay. I mean, first of all, the car, uh, you had some car issues. We've had a lot of car <laughs> issues over the history of doing the show. Yeah, because we want, I always, I love old cars. Yes. Especially interesting ones. And people think that they're maintaining them, and they're not. And we go, is this a good car? And they go, oh, yeah, I keep it perfect. And they don't. I know you're trying to be funny. Whoa. Now, what is she thinking, that lady? She's thinking, you know, I'm sure that's not Steve Martin and Jerry Seinfeld, but the resemblance is unbelievable. And were y'all able to fix it? Or you need somebody else no, for that? No, I remember we had to get in, like, a rent-a-car. <laughs> yeah. You and Steve and, and yeah. an old Buick. Yeah. And a Toyota Camry. Yeah, and a Camry. It was really makes you sad. <laughs> it wasn't exactly what you were hoping. No. Now, do you prepare... How do you prepare for these? Because it's I kind don't. of... You don't prepare at all? No. See, I'm more interested, like, uh, that first question I ask you is, you've had three coffees today. I like the tiny little behaviors of human life. Yes. What was the first one? Is it a routine? How do you make it? You know, I'm interested in coffee. I'm interested in, in people's beds and their shoes and their combs, you know. I, I like the, uh, small, the small things are the big things to me. Which makes total sense, right? Do yeah. you, now, do you make your bed? No, I do not. Does Jessica make your bed? Yes, she does. Of course she does. <laughs> of course she does. Why? Because I like Jessica. <laughs> she gets things done. Oh, she sure does. Right? Yeah. But aren't you lucky you married somebody like that and had children with somebody that gets everything done? Lucky is not the word. Saved is the word. Mm. I'm a rescue pet. <laughs> Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe.
from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what it looks and feels like. The storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free. Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? What kind of training regimen? How are you doing, Lester? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. So you don't prepare at all? You don't Google? Like, what if you don't know the person? You know everybody? I Google, I read the first three sentences. I just want to know where they grew up, are they yeah. married, they have kids. Okay. That's all. I don't need to know anything else about a person to have a So Wikipedia is really your sort of... Yeah. Yeah. I. The things I'm interested in are not, in, you know, in the bio. Which makes the, the show so good. Oh, thanks. And the coffee table book. Did you ever think you'd have a coffee table book? No, I didn't. Are you proud of it? I didn't. <laughs> well, they don't give you a book unless the show works. Yes. So, yes, I am proud of it. And the show worked, and people are asking, will there be more? They are. I don't know. I actually just started thinking about it just recently, but I did a movie, and I'm kind of... Uh, you did a movie? I made a movie, yeah, during the... Uh, the virus, we wrote a movie and then we made it, and now we're finishing it and it's going to come out pretty soon. Wow, what does that feel like? Amazing. Yeah. That's something I never thought I would do. But because of the virus, I wasn't doing anything and I had time to write it. Because otherwise I, don't, I can't stop doing stand-up. I can't stop. It's too, too much fun. Yeah, it's just like, it's like my life <laughs> uh, routine. I have to, you know, it's you so much fun. So now the fact that there's going to be this film. Yeah. Can you tell me anything about it? Sure. Have you already talked about it and I just didn't do no, enough I research? No, I haven't. I haven't. What, what is it? Um, it's a, it takes place in 1964. Wow. So it's a period piece. Yes. It takes place in Battle Creek, Michigan. And it's um, about how they invented the Pop-Tart. Wow. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah. Do you like a pop tart? I love the pop tart. Which, which is your favorite flavor? Brown sugar. Cinnamon, Me too. Of course. Me too. But a lot of people like strawberry, with the frosty. That's them. No, but brown sugar cinnamon. See, that was the probably the first. Is that the first thing you made when you were a kid that was hot? Yes. Yeah. Or maybe an Eggo waffle, but hot. Right. Yeah. That's the most luxurious thing, like because an Eggo waffle, is just like toast, glorified yeah, toast. Yeah. Right. A but pop tart a pop is compl tart, complicated. It has all that. Sometimes some of them have yeah. sprinkles. Mm -hmm. So is this a is this a real story or you? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't there are certain real elements in it. Okay. The truth of the story is, Post and Kellogg's both had the idea at the same time. Wow. And then they competed to who could come out with it first. Yes. And then we just completely made Came up. Came up. Totally insane. Comedy. It's like 15 stand-up comics are in this. Are you, are you starring in it? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I directed it. That is incredible. I know. It's really exciting. Most people just learned how to, like, bake bread during the pandemic, and you yeah. wrote and directed and are going to star yeah. in a film. Yeah. Can we get coffee and talk about it when it comes out? Sure. And maybe bring Jessica. But I do want to ask you. you your wife posted something right. on Instagram. Right. I follow her. Right. I adore her. <laughs> um, I thought Thank you. it was a simple way to say something that needs to be said. In October, Jerry's wife of 23 years, Jessica, posted on Instagram in support of the Jewish faith after a string of highly publicized anti-Semitic events. The post read, 
I support my Jewish friends and the Jewish people. And the caption read, if you don't know what to say, you can just say this in your feed. When we look at the rise of anti-Semitism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in this country and really around the world, mm -hmm. um, what, like, how, what, do you, how, what do you think of it? She found a simple, uh, and I thought, non-aggressive yeah. way to say something that, as we said, unfortunately needs to be said, but does need to be said. And uh, I thought that was very uh, special and, and fantastic thing she did. Mm -hmm. Hard to do. It is hard right? to do. Well, simplicity. Most things in that venue, it's going to trigger someone. It's going to inflame. We're so quick for, to inflame, right? Mm -hmm. Both sides of any debate. Yes. Women, uh, gender, ev everything, yeah. right? This is the culture we live in. Flash paper. Yeah. Instant, violent yes. verbiage. Yes. Right? And she found a way to sort of quiet it. Right. And hopefully also raise awareness. Yeah. That was a great thing. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> This is what it looks and feels the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Okay, I want to go over a list of some of these comedians that were on. Okay. And just if you have something to say, okay, say it. Um, Eddie Murphy. I feel like Eddie Murphy was like, well, was maybe the best episode there ever was. That was probably next to the Obama one, which was unique for those circumstances, yes. obvious. But uh, reconnecting with Eddie, who he and I started together the same month, the same club together. And then, of course, he quickly went one way, and then I went another way. And, and then years, after all those years, to get back together was so thrilling. And he was so, again, you, I talk about this, thing yeah you know yeah and there it is and he's still got it you know and he's still talking about it and he talks about in the show being on Long Island and going to these clubs with these guys in a car and then after the club you go to a place like this oh my gosh this is the life this is the life hanging out with the company you do the show you do great you do horrible <laughs> but you wind up here there's Having a, coffee and a pastrami sandwich. Yes, and and writing jokes on napkins, and making fun of each other, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Did you ha do you have napkins where you have jokes? I mean, do you remember you yourself doing that coming to a, a no? Place? I got a notebook. Yeah, I said oh, I, I need a notebook for this work profession. I need <laughs> a notebook for this type of work. Yeah, <laughs> but you probably have. I'm sure you have written a joke or two down on a napkin. Yes, I have. To be reunited with him must have been very cool. It was. It was uh, beautiful. It was beautiful. And you could feel that. Oh, that's great. You could. So, you've seen a few of these. Yes, I've seen a few of yours. Oh, that's nice. People love the show. Wow. Did you not know that? I, for most of the time I was doing it, I didn't think it was working. You didn't think it while you were doing it? Yeah. But I loved it. And I wanted to make it. Yeah. I just wanted to make this. Well, I, I want to show people this side of comedy life. Because 
People just got so interested in comedy yes. the past 20 yes. years, you know? Yes. So that's why I did it. I think also it's like, and why people are asking now is that that kind of connection, you know, that kind of being with somebody funny and making each other laugh, that kind of conversation, especially since y'all were together mm -hmm. in this small area, like mm -hmm. was something we, we missed during the pandemic, you know? Well, you tell me, don't you feel, I mean, you do more interviews than anyone. This kind of thing yeah. is different, right? Yes. Because you're not, because just like you said, there is no preparation. Right. You're just sitting down for a wonderful conversation over right. coffee. Right. But also, I think with the goal of laughing and having others laugh too. Mm hmm. Like there's a lightness to that, right? Very much so. And I'm not really much of a podcast person because I like edited content. Yeah. I like. I love that I could take three hours and give you a great 12. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> that, that's what comedy it? is. Yes. When you go see a comedian, he's basically going, I have lots of crazy thoughts, some of them are funny, and I've cut it down to just that. Yes. That's what you're seeing. Because when you work on a show, you write something, how long does it take like, to get down to what you're actually going to perform? Well, I don't know because I do it all the time. Yeah. But everything is trimmed down to the and an essential aspect of comedy is it has to be trimmed down to the absolute minimum. It's like a poem. Yes. It has to be like and a good poem. books, really good books are yeah. edited well. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the most important part of it. Part yes. Of all of it. Yeah, but books are long. I love books. That's nice. You don't. I do. I love books, but I don't read a lot. I'm trying to think if I have anything good. If for I you. can get rid of the phone. Yeah, yeah, I put the phone I, away. Put I the phone away. Read. What are you doing on your phone? Nothing good. Scrolling? Well, how else can you get to the next thing? But we have to scroll. But what are you, are you looking at articles? Or are you looking at social media? What, what are you doing? Are you I on look Instagram? At cars. I'm, I, I look on Instagram and I love YouTube. No, you don't. I love YouTube. What do you like on YouTube? Cat videos? Here's what I found the greatest video on YouTube <laughs> what is it? yesterday. Oh my God. I have spent years on YouTube, <laughs> countless hours, and yesterday I found a video that changed my life so powerfully. A guy made a video about, you know how when you turn on your windshield wipers, sometimes they go, J -j 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 -j. Yes. He made a video about how to fix that. <laughs> how do you fix it? And you it? don't need new wipers. What, how do you? And you don't need a new wiper arm. It's an adjustment with two wrenches, and he shows Would you. Would you ever do that? Oh, I can't wait to do it. Are you going to do it? Yeah. So that's what I love. You love it. Because I hate when wipers do that. I hate that sound. I know what you and mean. And somebody solved it, and they made a video and, that, and, and showed everyone how How did you come to that YouTube video? I don't know. They, I they like targeted the, you. Yeah. You are, I YouTube. like the algorithm. I don't watch anything unless the algorithm suggests it. Well, you do. And they just targeted you with the yeah. perfect video, which is the windshield wipers. Windshield wiper wiper adjustment. So you like that kind of like how to fix it. You're not into... No, I'm into... I'm into... I'm surfing. Oh, surfing. Baseball. Cars. Dogs. I like cute dog videos. Yeah, who doesn't? You know. You should follow Round Boys on Instagram. It's really good. It's just round animals. <laughs> Your wife would love it. <laughs> just all about the roundness of animals. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love things like I love unboxing videos. Unboxing videos. Here's what it is. I really think obsession is a nice way to go through life. Yeah. Being obsessive. Yes. As long as you don't go completely crazy. <laughs> yes. Obsessing. I've obsessed on everything about everything my entire well, life. Well, that's true. That's why you're famous, right? Because the the show is like it's obsessing all, over the little nuance exactly. of life. Right. Yes. So that's entertainment to me. Yeah. Well, it's entertainment to us too. Yeah. Turns out. Turns out it's entertainment <laughs> to all of us as well. Yeah, but we all live these lives of uh, micro obsession, yes. right? Not microaggression. Micro obsession. Okay, I've learned so much. And those things, I think, are if you miss out on the fun of that. Yes. I just think it's fun. It's a fun... I, I like to find entertainment in life. Yes. I don't want to just drag myself through this. 
I want to enjoy it. Yes. No, it's so true. If you can't find the fun and the nuance and the tediousness of life, then you're not living. What was the point of yeah, all of that? It's true. Right? It's true. Find the fun in it. And I personally believe the fun is in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. sure not is. in the special. Mm -hmm. The ordinary. Really, I love right? this so much. I know, me too. I, I could okay. sit here forever. Me too. Cheers. Well, cheers. But can we do it when your movie comes out? Yes. Isn't it better? It's well the Pop Tarts, I can't wait. Well, just if, how are you doing? I, I know every day is different. How do you feel today? Yes, I, it's, it is the strange thing about MS. It really, it really is so variable and changes. I'm feeling really great now. I mean, I'm here with you. We're in front of a fire. I have my dog. I'm going to see my horse. I wrote a book. The book is phenomenal. I'll just say it. You are a writer, Selma Blair. Thank you. It means so much. It's hard enough to write a book. It's, it's hard, harder still to do it when you don't have all your faculties about you every day. It was the kindness of strangers who are no longer strangers, Brittany Bloom and my, my, my book agent at the book group and Julie. Um, the space they held for me and helping me and helping me type. I would send on a you know, yellow legal pad and take a picture. Be like, can you type this? And now, of course, now that the book's finished, I, I can read them right. <laughs> Just fine. Mm. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> no, funny but, how that worked. But we got through it. We got through it. And how do you feel knowing it's about to be out in the universe? I'm thrilled because when I did come out with the MS diagnosis, it really felt freeing. Um, but mostly to see that it helped other people just have a touchstone made me feel really good. It made me feel more useful. Um, I'd always get on myself, oh, you're lazy, you want to sleep. But then when I realized just at least by the act of being as honest as I could, um, it, it did something for other people and that in turn empowered me and you know it's just a whole thing of we're all in, we're all in this together. Well it's called Mean Baby. You got to explain the title. When I was just born people came over to visit the new Beitner baby. That was my last name. And they ran out of that house. These teenagers, don't go over there. The Beitners have a mean baby. <laughs> and it stuck. The things you're called, how they become part of your story, whether you mean to or not, sometimes. You write in the book about um, some very painful episodes, including um, you wrote about a teacher, an educator, who violated you. And you say, he didn't rape me, but he broke me. He broke me. I loved him. Loved him. Father figure. Having a personal betrayal of someone that loves you be so inconsiderate of your life path really hurt. It hurt me. And I miss him still as a friend, mm -hmm. the person that I had met and, and cared for as a mentor. But it feels to me you were quite courageous. I discovered wonderful things writing the book, like how much I had witnessed of friends and what I'd witnessed and what a gift that was here. And even, you know, how much I loved sharing things with people. But it wasn't until writing this book, and, and there is this mention of a rape, it was something I didn't even think of, because I think there were so many trespasses on my life, or things were cloudy with my shame. My, 
such a deep shame of my drinking in the past that I was talking one day to Brittany and I immediately told this after this spring break trip and then and I said but I, I, I won't I'm not going to write that in the book and she said well maybe you want to and then I thought oh of course I have to so many people have had some similar experiences that you just tuck away because you think people are going to say what did you do and why didn't you report and why didn't you do why didn't I was a kid I was young and even now it's hard to report stuff it's hard it's really hard and so I put it in the book and I even cringed as I was doing the audiobook because I thought how many more stories do I have like this that I didn't even acknowledge because there's so many. Mm. And I felt so sad for my body. I felt so sad. It kind of took the book and this process to even make you realize that you, you were a victim. People can take advantage. And, and then you're just too ashamed to say anything and then you just bury it and you bury it. You really do. And things do come back later when you're in a safer spot. But you still feel don't say you feel unsafe to say it, but I realize I am safe. And yeah, I am glad it's in the book. It's a big deal to have these things happen and to hold that shame in your cells like it's you. Mm. Like it's all you are is someone that's not worth helping on the side of the road. That you're worth someone to say. She's nothing. I'll never see her again. She's probably passed out the whole night. <laughs> you know, mm. well, the body remembers. The body remembers. And I want it to remember some love. I want it to remember this day. I want to remember this pink sweater and this dog and my son. I want to remember. I want to remember all the things. I want other people to, too. Don't be so indignant, because we can't all have our ways. Let's move forward and help each other. Yeah. Sometimes when horrible things happen, people, the shame cycle is so big. And I wanted to say, there is no real room for guilt in moving forward. There isn't. There's not much I feel ashamed of anymore, because it just happened and I did it, or someone did it to me, and I'm, I'm okay now. But things will keep happening, and I'll keep having to figure out how to rise above. And in some ways, it's that um, frame of mind that helped you finally get rid of alcohol and kick alcohol out of your life. How did you finally conquer it? What made the difference for you? It was only self-medicating and it wasn't working anymore. And when there was public humiliation and I owned it, it, there's no going back. I mean, now that I was a mother, it just changed everything. I think that's incredibly inspiring. When you've made mistakes, you own them, and you turn the page, and you smile and go forward. You do what you can to make it right for those affected and yourself. And it's important that you acknowledge, really acknowledge, and, and nothing's gonna help by still beating yourself up. You write in the book, I desperately love a story. We all have one. I carry mine inside me. You carry yours inside you. I can hear mine now in my own voice, strong and clear. What's your story? My story is that people would say to me, and I would roll my eyes when they'd say, don't give up before the miracle. Don't d commit suicide. Because I really was. I could not picture living long. But I think that my story really is that I am figuring it out now and I am kind to myself and I really do, really do have the capability to love. You're not the mean baby. I'm not the mean baby. I mean, we all can be a mean baby sometimes. Well, she needs to come out sometimes. I mean, so for sure. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act.
if you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's go. This is a critical turn point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's talk about your mom. It struck me that she was extraordinarily complex, glamorous, and beautiful, and dynamic and also emotionally elusive to you at times and sometimes cruel. I mean, I still adore my mother. She's the most important. My sisters, we cherish her, adore her. She's on a pedestal. But no, she was not a cuddly woman. She was a role model. She was a judge. She was a million things. Um, but her idea of me was not going to be met with, with what I was, I guess. I find it is so universal that we adore our parent so much, but, it, but it's complicated. I felt how torn you could be about your mom, who you clearly adored, and she adored you. And yet, there were stories that you reveal in the book that are kind of jaw-dropping. It's hard, because when you grow up with someone like that, you don't realize, because I'm a little like her, too. <laughs> you know, so you don't realize how like outlandish some things can seem when someone's kind of eccentric. Yeah. But my son said it to me. Um, I, I told him, you know, my mother, she was so critical by nature. And he's like, like you. And I'm like, oh, I am, but I think you're perfect. He's like, all you do is nag at me. Oh, wow. Like that's my kind of love language, thinking I could pick apart someone to make them better or something. I was really struck by it when you were a little girl one of the first things you learned is your mom saying, I wasn't sure when I was pregnant with my last baby that I really wanted to have a baby. But you know, in her defense to say, I didn't want you, it wasn't meant to be hateful. She meant it to say, oh, that would have been such a mistake to get rid of you. Thank God I have baby Blair. What was it like to grow up in that house? I felt like dying growing up. I mean, I did. And that's why I feel like I'm such a miracle right now <laughs> that I actually want to live. I want to be here. I want to enjoy this. I was so confused and lost and terrified. I was a terrified baby. And your mom would introduce you as, and this is Blair this is or Blair, Selma. This is Blair, Selma, you both. I went by both. This is Selma. This is the manic depressive. I have never been diagnosed with mania or de depression tongues. <laughs> That's mania. a label to put on a little kid. But, you know, it's dramatic. I think she meant it as a badge of honor. Like, I don't suffer fools. Like, we got real problems here. My kid, my kid's very grounded. She's very deep and disturbed. You know, I think that she felt it out of gravity. Why were you so scared as a little girl? Who wouldn't be? Look at where we are. It's so weird. <laughs> and then you know you're going to die one day, and your mother's going to die, and your sisters. I mean, it's terrifying to be a child and so readily be able to explore uh, the scarier things in life. It was a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that drinking uh, probably really cemented that mm -hmm. um, feeling in me. You started, you had your first drink when you were a little girl, seven years old. Yeah, my first drunk when I was seven. I had my first drinks, you know, much younger. Can you tell me about that? I thought it was God, it was at Passover Seder's. Uh, that I had my first drinks, and I always thought that was God. And then when I realized it wasn't, I was like, how convenient. It's in a bottle. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's even as a little kid, you're like, that's a comfort. So you started at seven, you drank through elementary school, middle school, high school, college. college. How did you do it? I mean, how did you function? 
I don't know how I did it. I do, it all makes sense why I was so exhausted. But it was, it was hard. I, I don't know, but and maybe it was easier. Maybe I would have never survived without a drink. How did it relieve your pain and your fears? Transitions have always been hard for me and the MS made that very evident. Um, so the drinking would, it, it made me feel warm and comfortable and part of people on this earth. You had a lot of physical ailments since you were a little girl. I mean, you tell the story about telling your mom your leg hurt. She's like, cut it out, Selma. You're all, I mean, I was made fun of my whole life for that leg. You and I'm like, this leg? <laughs> and it was, this leg? It was this leg that I leg. can't feel? Yeah, it was. And you had a fever for three years. I did. It was a big deal. I mean, doctors thought I had leukemia. We didn't know. I didn't. I didn't. But it was, I had a constant high fever. I had so many things that were so indicative of MS growing and optical neuritis young and losing my vision for good. Do you feel, when you look at those physical ailments as a child, do you think, have you ever been told, that probably was the beginning of MS or that oh, somehow absolutely. connected? Absolutely the ailments as a kid connected. I don't know if I really did have juvenile MS at like six when we noticed my eye was first going or movements. But I do know for sure I had it by the age of 23, and it was definitely there for so long. And the pain is still there. I'm in remission. I built no new lesions, but I still have the, you know, some brain damage and things that are there. But I'm okay with it. It's, I'm okay. I'm grateful because I'm doing so much better. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> you get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Let's talk about your MS diagnosis. How do you feel about the fact that it took so long to get a proper diagnosis? It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to have a neurological illness. That was the onset of MS, which is just a symptom of a really unhealthy immune system. I thought I had a million things that weren't what they were. And I would have been a lot kinder to myself if I didn't feel the need to self-medicate or check out or get through. I mean, I wasn't always checking out. I was really trying to be as capable as I could be, and I had no idea, and I was really cruel to myself. I treated myself like garbage. And the medical community sometimes was saying, maybe it's in your mind. It's like, oh, you're fine, you're dramatic, you're talkative, you're... But I would say, I am so tired, I can't move, and this has, hap this has been going on for 20 years. Even that doctor that diagnosed me, he was saying this might be functional, emotional, what traumas happen. And I fell asleep in his office, and he said to my boyfriend at the time, What's she doing? And he's like, oh, she falls asleep everywhere. And he's like, oh, wait, stand up. Put your arms out. Shut your eyes. Plank. Fell over. Like, had no idea of proprioception. 
I didn't know I had proprioception issues. I didn't know that my vision was a hallway. Because if you've had it your whole life, you just think that's how everyone is. It was, the, it was mind blowing to realize there was a diagnosis for this and that other people have it and don't know. And I don't mean to be tough on the doctors, but you really, you really gotta do better for the women. You have to do better for all of us in diagnosing these things. You didn't have to come out publicly. You didn't have to share your journey. Why did you make that choice? I hadn't worked for years because I had been so sick and I, it was kind of flaring because worse because I was going back to work. I was getting on planes. The planes make it worse. I was falling apart in the airport. I couldn't get out of the fetal position or else my body would spasm. And I was getting vertigo all the time. And, and the doctor even said, with the best intentions, don't tell people. Like, just don't. We're going to get this under control. But because I had such a bad reaction to the first treatment, it made it so much worse. I was really um, having a lot of movement and speech difficulties that were exacerbated by the prednisone. It just kept getting worse as the diagnosis went on. So it was, so the stem cell really helped. But coming out and talking about it, the story would be told anyhow. So I wanted to gain control of that. And I didn't realize how empowering it would be and how empowered I would be to then tell the truth forevermore after that. What did you think when you started seeing the reaction? I was so touched and I felt so thrilled. Oh, this is what it is to just be a human and show up. Mm -hmm. And to think that there's even a moment that I could have com comforted someone or given them an option or think about maybe if stem cells right for them. I'm really, really happy to be able to walk into this space of empowerment and realizing I, I am a calm and stable grown up. I'm okay. <laughs> even though I've not always been. You had a big night at the Vanity Fair party. That was your first night coming out since your diagnosis. What did it take to do it, and what did it mean to you to be there? I had no idea how much it would mean to show up trying to look my best in a really aggressive flare, and that was a real coming out party for me because I know it meant something to other people and certainly to people with more radical disabilities to see an in, you know? Oh right, this world is ours too. You might not see the ramp there on the stage, but there's people coming to use it and I'm gonna be one of them. I remember our moment meeting. And I loved you so much and you were such a girl, you were such a sister to me. And we were in the bathroom and I felt really nervous and you really took my hand. I had the cane, I had the dress, but everyone scurried away as they should and you stayed. I was overwhelmed that night and it was hard. I was afraid that I would vomit. That used to happen out of nowhere. I was afraid I'd trip and ruin the dress. Just really very real things of, oh my God, I'm not in the same body. And I just cried because of gratitude, but also I don't know if I can get through this night. Yeah, that's courageous. You wrote that you never practiced the Oscar speech in front of a mirror, that you never really had those leading lady aspirations. No. Why not? I never felt I was I was the one leading the pack here, and I was very comfortable to witness the greats and be a part of it. But I dare say, I, I'd probably chase that leading lady role a little harder now. <laughs> but I didn't have it in me before. I didn't want to. Well, maybe you I didn't will. even want to, but maybe I will one day. Maybe it will be there for me. I mean, I'm improving on all the ways. But consistency is really key on a set and the energy. and. Certain triggers will make my body do different things. And I'm not embarrassed of it, but I don't want to take people's time. But yet I would like to, I saw it, Christine Applegate, you know, she did the last season of Dead to Me, and she was really dealing with a lot of health, major health challenges, and watching her do it, that was an inspiration. So it's like, okay, if I were ever be able to go back to work, I'd want it to be incredible. This is what it looks and feels like. the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> 
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what it looks and feels like. The storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. That brings us to the documentary because the documentary really tells the story. When I watched the documentary, the word that I thought of was fearless. You were fearless. I'm so sorry, I can't talk right now. We're shooting the final days of my life. You showed it all. Yeah. Why did you want to do that? Because what I was going through with MS looked nothing like I just couldn't find it. Jen Brea, she did a documentary I saw called Unrest. She had like an inflammatory, like there's an encephalitis issue and very similar to what I was going through. And I thought, I can't believe a woman is showing this and not afraid someone's gonna put her in a straitjacket. And if you say too much, they think you're a mental patient. The doctor would tell me, you're just dehydrated. <sighs> Everyone gets stressed. I was always so afraid of losing credibility. Mm. And so she gave me permission. That documentary of opening her life made me feel like I had permission to also have that impact for someone. So I've had a mess many years. I had a very late diagnosis. I've had it at least 25 years, at least. So I had nothing. There was any embarrassment I could get over. But if there's someone else that it would move the needle for them to have some agency in their life and to trust themselves, no matter how odd or dramatic or nothing their symptoms might be from day to day. Because this is the stuff I was afraid of. Let's talk about Arthur, that sweet boy. In a way, the documentary was for him. Why did you want him to see this someday? Has he seen it? He has seen it, finally. He went to the premiere. He he is. He's like, it wasn't that boring. Thanks. He liked it. When I was going to do stem cell, I thought because I felt so physically and emotionally so awful and drained that I did think there's a chance I won't make it. And so I did want that to be to him knowing that if I did go because my body had given out, that I wanted him to know that I really wanted to be here with him. I really wanted to take the, the steps that it took to be here. Because I was really one of those people that was like, no way, even if I have cancer, I'll never do chemo. That's just the worst thing for your body. I had a real feeling about that. And then when I felt the chemo and I felt better, it's like, okay, just let go of what you're thinking and just try and feel better for your son. But yeah, you can die. I thought if anyone would die, it would be me in that moment because I just was so, I was just so tired. Oh. So I did it for him really um, to just say, I. I did want to communicate with you. You're too young to really care now, and I don't tell you, but I, I want you to know you're the last, you're the first thing on my mind and the last thing on my mind. You, you fought to still be here. Yeah. And with I everything you've really got. Well. I really did, and I know we, we all will come to times where we're gonna have to fight harder than we think, and, and I was supported. I was lucky. What do you hope he sees when he sees you moving through the world? I hope he sees that when you have something that could potentially be a real setback, in time, it might not happen right away, but in time, set yourself up to recover, you know? And I don't want him to feel ashamed or too scared that he can't move forward. I am so grateful that I'm moving forward because I did not want to my whole life. I wanted to figure out how to die with the least pain possible. <laughs> and I don't now. What kind of mom do you think you are? Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I talk too much to strangers. But I think I am fun. He loves that I'm willing. If he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he can't sleep, it's like, okay, let's go find an adventure. Like for an hour and then we'll go back to bed. There's things that I see that I was scared of that he doesn't have at all. 
I give him. He does not want the effusive love that I craved from my mother. So he'll have his own memoir about how I, you know, tried to kiss him too much. But I, I, I give him I give him tons of space. I can really see him as his own person, but I love I love that I'm the person he he comes to, that he trusts the most. You went and saw a psychic or a fortune teller, and this person told you you're gonna be an advocate. It was Tyler Henry. And I was like, is there anything in my future? And he's like, I don't really see you acting. <laughs> and I was like, cut the tapes, guys. <laughs> I want people to think. You know, but I had been really sick for a long time, and he, he did say, I see you being an advocate. I never saw in a million years that I would be an advocate of let's calm, regroup, and figure out how to move forward. And I'm here. Your inspiration comes from overcoming, whether it's MS or addiction yeah. or abuse or hardship or it's overcoming. It's such a relief to give myself permission to say it's okay. No matter what, the guilt doesn't move through. I have to realize that. It's okay to so be light. So it's not that I'm being cocky of yes. saying like, oh, forgive myself for these things, but truthfully, you're not gonna help anyone else until you've forgiven yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, it's so good to see you. When you walk in, it's like sunshine has arrived in our little dark room. It's your season. Christmas is here. So question first, is your Christmas tree up? Oh, of course. My Christmas tree was up before Thanksgiving. We, yeah. And the day after Thanksgiving, we turned all the Christmas lights on in my yard, in my house. I mean, yeah, so I'm always about Christmas. Now, I have, one wait. Other, I have one other question for you. When do you take all of those Christmas decorations The first down? week after uh at first of the year. So you feel Sometime like that's... Sometime within that year, yeah. I'm already going. Sometimes I'll keep a few little things. My birthday's the 19th of January. Of course. Sometimes I'll keep a few little things in the house to think, well, I'll celebrate my birthday with, with a little tree, maybe in one room or Sweet. so. Sweet. <laughs> you, you've had so many Christmas memories since you were a little girl to today. Is there a Christmas that kind of stands out to you? Like, a lot of people say it was maybe before, even before all the fame and before all that. Like, is there one that sticks out to you and you say that Christmas. Well, that memory I actually made a movie of called Circle of Love. That was when my mom and dad had been married for years, had a house full of kids, and mom had never had a wedding ring because they married when they were 15 and 17 years old. So I remember all of us making up money to help buy mama a wedding ring, mm -hmm. and we all got to be part of that and remembering how special that was back there in the country and mama, you know, being so happy and surprised mm. about a ring and it made a wonderful story. But I have tons, tons of memories. A little yeah. brother that was born around Christmas time because we always wanted our walking, talking dolls. Mm -hmm. Mom said, well, you got one that really pees and really cries <laughs> and really does all the stuff that you're wanting that little doll to do. Here you are. So I have a lot of precious memories being from the country and, you know, being back Back oh. in the backwoods where you make your own fun, you make your own Christmas. And you make your own memories. Boy, yeah. you've got some good ones. I want to talk about that, but I want to talk about this movie that you have out called Dolly Parton's Mountain Magic Christmas. This is all parts of you. <gasps> Dolly Parton, Christmas, Dolly. I'm starting to cry just thinking about it. It's got all your friends. It's a beautiful story of putting on a show. It's a musical, it's a movie. When I saw it, I was like, that is so Dolly, that's all of it. Well, we're so excited about the, the movie. And of course we did it at Dollywood, mm -hmm. which is my theme park up in mm -hmm. East Tennessee where I was born and raised. It's like a, a movie set anyway, some sure. of everything. And so we invited all these wonderful guests like Jimmy Fallon, uh -huh. uh, you know, who's on the show. And so we've had all these great you know, people on and great actors. We did a show about, a, it's like a show within a show because mm -hmm. I think people are real interested in knowing what goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So we made it where we really made it like how the show was going on, all the things that can go wrong 
behind the scenes, but then we actually did the numbers as if they were rehearsals, getting ready to actually do it live sort of thing. So it's a lot of drama, it's a lot of comedy, a lot of meaningful songs, a lot of meaningful places, stuff for kids, you know, we got sing-alongs with the kids, so, uh, and getting to do it at home was great for me. I mean, the list of celebrities is pretty amazing. It's Willie Nelson, it's Jimmy Allen, it's your goddaughter, Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus and, her, and her daddy, And her Billy daddy, Billy, Billy, <laughs> Billy Ray. And we've got Jimmy Fallon. I mean, the list is it like, is, wow, wow, Zach wow. Zach Williams doing our great Grammy Come winning on. song. There was Jesus, which is perfect for oh. the show. And so, yeah, we got the Fallons and the Allens. And and we and Willie it was a dear thing to me to get to work with Willie again. We've been friends since we were both fairly young in Nashville. Was it so fun? It, it seemed to me, there are a lot of sets that seem like work, but this thing seemed different to me when I was watching it. Because I, I, I got to see uh, parts of this already, and it looked electric, like you'd want to see this on Broadway kind of thing. Oh, well, good, and you might. But I had a lot of my family participate, sure. a couple of my sisters, Cassie and Rachel, a lot of my nieces, my little grandnephew, Liam, plays the little elf. And so we've just got all kinds of stars, all kinds of wonderful actors playing the parts of the people behind the scenes. So you and Jimmy Fallon have a song. It's called Almost Too Early for Christmas. Okay, you heard the song. What was the first thing you thought when you heard it? It's almost too early for Christmas. Why don't we see how it goes? Well, I, first of all, there was a little backstory to okay, that. Jimmy me. was going to be on my Christmas show. He said, let me send you the song and see what you think. And he sent that to me, though, like in September. And so it was called Too Early for Christmas. I thought, wow. What a great idea for a yeah. song. It's almost too early for Christmas because the Halloween decorations are still out and the Christmas haters and all. So he <laughs> sent me the song and I just loved it. He said, would you sing on it with me? Because we'd done Mariah Carey's song in my Christmas album of All I Want for Christmas is You. Yeah. So I knew he could sing good and we sounded good <laughs> together. I just love him and he sings great. He's just an all-around great guy. Isn't he? I know, and y'all sitting in that booth singing that song was so cute. Oh, I loved I it. Know. I loved it. It's so cute, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just, Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Take me back home for just a minute, if you wouldn't mind. So you were uh, the fourth child in your family of mm -hmm. how many kids? Well, there's 12. Mom and Daddy had 12 children, six boys and six girls. Mm -hmm. And so we had a big, big family, and we lived back in the woods, but we had a good time. And, you know, we just loved each other and... Christmas, we made Christmas whatever. We made it. Mama was always great to make everything seem fun and happy and made things more exciting than they were. And so we just did what all country people do. We made the most of it. One of my favorite questions to ask somebody, because I feel it's, it's such a window into their life, is close your eyes for a second. Okay. And then imagine your childhood bedroom. Look around. See what around see. In, with my eyes closed, I'm with looking. Your, what okay, am I look, looking for? You're, you're, look, you're just looking at your room, and or <laughs> who who was okay. with you in your room? Were there anything on the walls? Were there multiple <laughs> kids? What? Where did you sleep? Like, what was that childhood Actually, bedroom? Actually, I don't have to close my okay. eyes to see that room <laughs> because me. we, you know, in the early days, you know, we we lived a few different places, but in the early days, you know, we our house was really small, and mom and daddy had a little separate 
area where they slept. But we mostly just piled up. We had two or three beds, and we had three or four kids sleeping in, in bed, and some of them peed in the bed, and we just dealt with that too. And it was cold in the winter. We'd fan the cover, get cold with that. But anyway, I just we just loved we, Daddy get up building the fire in the mornings. You know, Daddy, is the fire hot? You know, is the fire hot? <laughs> That's Mom what y'all said? Up. Yeah, and so we didn't. he wouldn't let us get up till the house was warm because it was cold in our old houses. But anyway, I just remember things hanging on the wall would be like a picture of Jesus or those little two little kids, two little orphans crossing a bridge and, you know, those famous little pictures you see, yeah. the Lord's Supper in the kitchen hanging on the wall and, or coats and hats and whatever. But we just lived a simple rural life like so many country people do. But, but it was a house full of love and, and warmth. And so even though it was cold outside, it was warm mm. in our hearts. Who, who taught you about generosity? Oh, that was, I, that, I'm from a faith-based family. Yeah. My grandpa was a preacher. So when you grow up like that, you, you're supposed to, it's better to give than receive. Although as kids, we, we loved getting the presents, you know, whatever we got. But I think you, I just always had a, a giving spirit, the same as my mom and my dad. We're just good-hearted country people. Did you remember witnessing it, or was it just part of life? It was part of life. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was, it was the way you survived in the country. Everybody yeah. had to help everybody else. If it was hog-killing time, or the neighbors knew who, who, whose day that was, or if they would go help somebody in the crops. If it was, you know, if, you were, if your tobacco crop was money, which ours was, yeah. different neighbors would come to help, and they worked at different times. So it was just what, how you survive in the country, and I think you just kind of learn to do that, and that just follows you all the days of your life. Faith is such a big part of your life. When would you say that your faith was tested the most? Well, I think we all go through things in yeah. our lives, and I don't know for certain. There's been several times people always, and, and I talk about that in the special, people always act like I'm sort of an angel. I say, I'm no angel. I just play one on TV. <laughs> it's tough out there. I just try hard, and I try no matter what I'm going through, and we all go through all sorts of things, but I just try to rely on that faith mm. and believe that through God all things are possible mm. and that I'm going to survive and that I can survive because I have faith to do it, and a lot of people depend on me. And there's a saying in Scripture, I believe, that says, to whom much is given, much is required mm -hmm. or much is expected. So anytime I get to you know, feeling too far down or feeling too sorry for myself, I just think about that and think, well, God has blessed me in so many ways, so why am I going to wall around in my little dab mm -hmm. of sorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. When uh, the holidays are festive, and I want to talk about all that, but it also does bring back memories for a lot of people. And in the country music world, Loretta Lynn and Naomi Judd passed oh, wow. this just, just over these past months. And loss is something that people deal with differently. And I just was curious how you deal with loss, like, of them. Well, those things are very special. Like with Loretta, I, she was very dear to me, like a sister. Same with uh, Naomi. Uh, we, were, we, we were same age, and we loved the same things. And I loved her. And then I also lost Kenny Rogers, three of my dearest mm -hmm. people in the business in a very short period of time. And I grieve over them almost like you do a family mm -hmm. member. And I think of them, and but you try to keep the good memories. You don't try to try to dwell. You're sorrowful, of course, of the loss and when it happens. But then you allow yourself to just think of all the things that you remember about them that has added to your life, mm -hmm. and remember what they did for all the millions of people, the the lives that they touched. And so you just think you're just thankful that you got to know them. And that you got to share that time. Like you said, there's that old song you talked about memories. Mm -hmm. There's that old mm. song of precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul, how they linger ever near me. You know, it's like, mm. and then it's like the line I love in that song is precious memories, unseen angels mm. sent from somewhere to my soul. And I think about that, you know, like those precious memories, they're like, they just flow in and out of you and mm. you remember special things about them. And so I love that line in that song. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. I feel very weepy. Yeah. I don't know why. I think oh, well, just I listening. Just like to, that's just a beautiful touches. line. Yeah. And that's how it feels, you know, like the unseen angels. And you feel like they're still all around you. You feel and them. you feel them, yeah. Mm. Boy, that's so beautiful. I feel like the other, there's so many magical parts about you, but it's that you keep um, you are evolving through life. And I've listened to Miley Cyrus, your goddaughter, say, I learned this from Dolly, I learned that from Dolly, I learned this from Dolly. <laughs> 
But then I was wondering, what is she teaching you? What are you learning about life from Miley? Well, I'm just learning Miley <laughs> as we go. Yeah. Well, I love Miley. And, I, you know, even when Miley goes through Miley's things, when back when she was making her transition from the Hannah Montana mm -hmm. little thing, trying to get to grow up, and yeah. people were not allowing her that. And, and I would, they were telling me, you got to talk to Miley. I said, look. You will never have me saying nothing bad about Molly because Molly is so gifted, so talented, so smart. Sure. I love her like you love your child. You watch them grow and you love to see them blossom. And so I just, I've watched her and I'm, I really admire her, her talent mm -hmm. and how she conducts herself. She knows who she is. She does. And she's doing it her she? way. I've always done it my way. And I hope she learned a little bit of that from me. Yeah. That be you. It's like I say to her, you be you and I'll be me. And together, you know, we'll be us and that'll be a beautiful thing. And uh, she was on my Christmas show, as sure. we mentioned. And then I'm also uh, hosting. I know. The, uh, yeah, her oh. New Year's Eat party from Miami, and so we're so excited about that. Cause Lord what knows is that? what's going to happen then. I was going to say you and Miley hosting a New Year's Eve special yeah. is like the perfect combination. I so what so is going to go down? Give me a little. We don't know. You don't know. We're going to do a couple of skits, and we're going to do uh, <laughs> a song, a couple of songs. We may do something with Def Leppard, uh, Wait, a rock song. Well, you know, I'm now a rock star. <laughs> So I'm going to sing a little something with them, and we're going to do a couple of a duets, some, some medleys, and we might even sing Jolene, you know, toward the end. But uh, we're, I don't know how much I should tell without Molly <laughs> kicking my butt, because I don't know how much is going to be a surprise. I do basically know what we're doing. Okay. But there's so much of us that's hosting that will just be us being yeah. us, and no scripts, no nothing. I'm sure we'll have some guidelines that we'll have to follow yeah. for the timing. But yeah, sure. I have no idea what we're going to wear, which I'm going to probably be a little more bold than of normal. Of course. You've and got Miley to. is always bolder than normal. So I, I think it's going to be fun. Will and from Miami. From Miami. Will there be cocktails, or are you a no cocktail person? Oh, well, at, at New Year's Eve? Yeah. Uh, whether I was or whether I wasn't, <laughs> I'm going to have a, a Shine Girl moonshine <laughs> cocktail. <laughs>
done some rock and roll things or rock, you know, covered some rock uh -huh. and roll songs, but I never thought of myself as a, a rock star. When people say, oh, you're a rock star, you know, that was just them saying, oh, you're cool or whatever. You know right. how people say, ah, oh, you're a rock star. But my husband loves rock and roll, but I'm, you know, I've just done everything in country and I know how hard you work at your craft. Sure. And when they, they said they wanted to put me in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and there were so many other people, I also thought that they just voted on that and it was like that person was going to go in. And I thought, I am not taking any votes from any of these people that spend their lives doing that like I spend my life doing this. Yeah. And so I found out later that they give it to you for if you've influenced other people and other, you know, I found out more about it. Mm -hmm. But I had said at the start I didn't want to, to accept it because I didn't think I'd earned it. Hmm. And still ain't sure. <laughs> but I thought, well, time is good. You know me, I'm about time. And I thought, well, if they're going to give it to me anyhow, I'm going to accept it gracefully. Oh. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a rock album and just make the most of it. Okay, Carl Dean, your husband of 56 years, um, he loves rock and roll. So is he thrilled that you're doing a rock album? Well, he's praying for me, I think. <laughs> I guess he's hoping I can pull it off. But I really think it's some of the best work I've ever done. I think wait, I've already done it. For real? I've already been working on it. It's going to come out next fall. Wait, wait, wait. The best work you've ever done? I think so. Only because it's different for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I worked, you know, I wanted it to be good. I didn't want anybody to be able to criticize me too much. They might, anyhow. But I really think people might be surprised because I've loved these songs for years. Yeah. And the songs that I chose, I chose a lot the songs he loved and then some that I loved and I wrote a few things too and Kent Wells my longtime uh, musical director band leader guitar player uh, he produced it I just knew he was right because he's always kind of he's got mm -hmm. that you know rock rock and roll in him sure so he did a wonderful job and we used all these great rock musicians and I'm going to have a lot of the uh, iconic singers join me on several of the That's songs cool. Well, I'm asking, yes. but Pat Benatar is going to join me on something, and Pink is going to join me Pink. on, don't you love, love. that? I did great songs like uh, uh, Purple Rain, mm. did my version of, a lot of songs that I love, that people love, so I've got a lot of word out to a lot of people, so we'll see who winds up on it. You know what, this is so cool, I'm sitting here listening to you, and you're doing something for the first time. People don't often do something for the, for the first time, but you, I feel like, you get out of your comfort zone. You're like, I do this and now I'm gonna do that. Like, will you tell me about that part of your life? Well, I just work whatever feels right. You know, I've always kind of just rolled like a river. You know, I just let the let it flow. I just kind of yeah. let God lead me, so to speak. And it just seems to be the right time to do certain things. And here I am at 77 years old. On, Next girl. year when I come out, I'm gonna be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> for a minute, but I really, I gave it, I give it all I got, whatever it is. And so I did not want to be embarrassed by doing a rock album. So I really gave it all I had and I'm just hopeful that people are going to, well, hopefully they'll just accept it because they put it. me in the Rock and Roll <laughs> Hall of Fame. So if I'm going to be there, I'm going to, I will feel like, you know, I feel like I need to earn it. So uh -huh. this is my contribution back to say thank you for putting me in there. So now maybe, you know, I can rest rest easy that I might have earned it. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. This is what it looks and feels the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. 
Jeff Bezos recognized wow. that he thought he was going to give one of his huge grants to you to distribute for your charities. What did you make of it when you got well, the call Well, you know, Bezos? it happened. Same day that I was being inducted into the Hall of Fame, I got a call saying Jeff Bezos uh, wants to speak to you, and here's his number. He wants, he's at home waiting for you to call. So and I thought, what is he calling me for? I thought maybe they wanted me to do a commercial for Amazon or <laughs> something. You know, I thought, well, that's weird. But of course, out of respect, you call. And uh, then we talked for a little bit. And then when he, he told me, I said, are you telling me that you're giving me $100 million for, for my charities? And he said, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. No strings attached, except that it all has to go to sure. you know, charity. And I started to cry on the phone. And it was just really like, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little, you know, I, it really moved me. I mean, it just huh. to think that I was thinking, you know, what a generous thing to do. And then I was just thinking of all the great things that I could do for so many needy people. And I just thought, wow, thank you, God. You know, and it was like, um, it was amazing. It was, it was just out of nowhere. And just I guess you can imagine what a wonderful day that was, getting put in the Hall of Fame and then also getting that because I spent about $1,000 buying tickets for the lottery for that $2 billion <laughs> lottery thing. And then, of course, I didn't win any of that. And then I, that same day, I won, you know, not won. I felt like I'd won the lottery by, you know, getting that $100 million to help all these wonderful causes. But I really think whether it's his money or whoever's money, I think if you're in a position to help, you should, and you, you should choose things close to your heart that you can be proud of to represent and be out there and feel good about what you've done. So it's, you're supposed to help one another. Can I ask you the most basic of questions? Why do you sing? Why do I sing? Because I can't help it. <laughs> I mean, that's who I am. That's what I do. I was, my grandpa said I came out uh, crying in the key of D, so they named me Dolly. <laughs> But anyway, that music is a big part of my family. It's just, it is in my DNA. And so I sing because that song, I sing because I'm happy, you know. I sing because I'm free. I sing, you know, because I have every reason in this world to sing. And so I love it, and that's what I do. Well, you don't do it for the money, and you don't do it for the fame. I know that for sure, because I, I feel I would like do it without the fame <laughs> and the money. I've always said I yeah. would, if I worked as a waitress, because I love to sing and write, I'd be saving my tips to make demo records to send to Nashville to try to get my songs recorded or be singing in the local bar or at the county fair or wherever I could, I'm certain that I would sing no matter what my life would have been. Let's talk New Year's resolution since this is, you are coming up on this Miley, the special with Miley Cyrus. What, what do you have on your list? Well, I'm like everybody else, you know, you make a bunch of resolutions and you never keep them. No. Third weekend of January, that's just all forgotten, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I hope, my hopes for the new year is I think what all good-hearted, faith-based people are just good, you don't even have to be faith-based, just good people, are hoping for a little more kindness, a little more love, a little more trying to pull together instead of falling apart. And one of the songs I wrote for my rock album is called The World's on Fire. And it's about that whole, you know, liar, liar, the world's on fire. What you gonna do when it all burns down? Liar, liar, the world's on fire. But we still got time to turn it all around. It's like an anthem and it's all about what's going on. And it's, uh, and so that's what I'm hoping and praying for, that in the new year that we can try a little harder. We've been through so much with the pandemic all over the world though, with just the weather and all the, yeah. you know, just the scary stuff, the scary earthquakes stuff. and things, it's just, you just think, well, you got to think positive. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this Christmas show mm -hmm. because I felt like I needed to help, if I could, to bring some brightness and lift people's hearts up a little bit and, and really just, uh, you know, sing some songs that are meaningful, tell some stories that are fun, and just take people's minds off of that. But I'm just hoping that next year and the year after and the years to come that we can, we've learned a little bit about what's going on and how long can we go, you know, like that. Can't we rise above? Can't we show some love? Can't we just lift up and, you know, just help help each other out? You know, it's like one of those things, can't we just, you know, move on? And we we all feel the same. We cry, we hurt, we bleed, we suffer. You yeah. know, we all want, yeah. you know, we all want to, you know, things for ourselves, but Lord, why can't we just, 
pray about it and think about it. And even if you're not even, a, like I say, a faith-based person, you've got to believe in good. And just like in yes. my show when I said, you know, a lot of people don't believe, you know, in in heaven. I would say, well, I do. And if I, if there is a heaven, I hope to hell I go. And I'm going to be working at it, you know, trying to get there because I'm going to try my best to try to bring as much joy as I can and lift people up as much as I can in my way. And I just think we all need to try a little harder. I don't care what our politics or our religion or our color or anything else. We need to try a little harder. So that's that's my personal New Year's resolution, to try a little harder myself, to try to make as much of that happen as I can through songs or through giving or through whatever it may be. Val, you're such a delight. It's such an awesome human being. I mean, well, so are you, and thank you. Like I say, I ain't all, I ain't all that, but I appreciate the compliment. And I've got a lot of wonderful people in my life that help me look really good. So I always like to thank them for it. So I just get to get out here and take a lot of credit for a lot of hard work that a lot of other people do. But we're getting it done, and that's the main thing. Love you. Yeah, thank you. Season's greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. Greetings, everyone. The holidays are upon us, and we are ready to celebrate right here on Today All Day. From tips for that turkey to cooking up your very first holiday spread, we have got you covered. So tune in to Today All Day, all season long. Hello. Hi. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Isn't this crazy all the way to the West Coast? Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Sitting across from you... I'm going to tell you right now is a privilege and an honor. What it are you is saying, a woman? privilege and an honor. Okay. Um, one word that you would use to describe yourself. Ebullient. Ebullient. Why, why that word? Because it's my nature. I never used to be like this, but I, I, I have come to appreciate every little moment. Describe, describe, you said you weren't always like that. Describe who the little girl was. Oh, the little girl Rosita Dolores Alverio was fearful, um, felt very unworthy, felt without value. Hmm. Uh, not necessarily my mom's fault, it was the fault of the times that anybody who came from Puerto Rico was not a good person. and. I learned that very, very early, and I learned it too well. How did, what was the first time you learned that, that you remember? I think I was five when uh, my mom had brought me to America. We lived in New York City and uh, in, in the ghetto, Hispanic ghetto. And on the way to kindergarten, I know this little gangs of white boys were just gathered there, it seems, to. Uh, tease and and uh, make deeply unhappy little girls, mostly little girls who pass by on the way to school and say bad names. And they were very scary. And you it, just tucked it, it away. Yeah. Tucked it away. And the trouble with tucking is that it sits there and festers. And you wonder, why, why do I feel so bad about myself? Huh. So this little girl who had all these feelings had a spark in her. She loved to perform, like what was it about the experience of performing oh, that turned the lights on that's for That's easy you? to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, grandpa in Puerto Rico, Abuelo, used to uh, have me dance to records. Remember records? Of course. I used to love to boogie, you know, and shake my little tush. <laughs> and he would hug me and kiss me and everybody in the family would say, isn't she adorable? And I thought, this is nice. I could do with more of this, truly. Did you like being Hispanic? 
not for a long time. Once I came to America, yeah. I perceived that it was not a good thing to be Hispanic. And for years and years and years, I battled that. How, so how did you, did you try to hide it? I did tried you? very much to hide it. I tried to be very American. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to be up to date in things, whatever mm -hmm. that happened to be, whether it was fashion or little funny sayings that Americans would make up, you know. And you chose um, a career that would put you into the spotlight, so that would highlight again. But I didn't who, know that. Ah. I didn't know that. Ah. All I knew was I want to be Elizabeth Taylor. That's what you thought? Yeah, we yeah. were the same age, more yeah. or less. Yeah. And she was beautiful yeah. beyond reason. I thought it was entirely possible. Mm -hmm. You know, until, until people tell you when you're young that it can't be, you believe it can. So you, th you, you wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor, you wanted to be on stage, on screen, and it started happening for you. But you, again, you know, you had a name that your agent thought was not gonna work. <laughs> he, he was like, uh-uh, not this name. So the, the casting director at MGM, mm -hmm. where I was under contract, said, uh, Rosita Alverio? He said, no, no. He says, that's too Italian. Rosita Alverio, okay. So he said, we gotta change your name. We finally settled, he said, who's your favorite actress at that time? And I said, uh -huh. Rita Hayworth. He said, we'll call you Rita. And he said, that last name really sucks. I said, my stepfather's last name, Moreno. Uh. So that's what it became. Rita Moreno. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Um, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> the big variable, the storm surge. Why was it important for you to be here? This is what it looks and feels like. the storm zone. The bigger piece of the puzzle comes. New numbers just out this morning. Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news just coming in. We begin this hour with the latest developments. We're coming on the air with some shakeups big time on Capitol Hill. How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News. Streaming free now. So you were getting parts and you were getting a lot of roles, but the roles seemed to have a common thread. Yeah. The thread was... Native girls. Yes. At first it was great. Anything would be good. Sure. Anything. I'd be in a movie. Everything was new and yeah. thrilling and delightful. And I looked prettier than I'd ever looked because the makeup was perfect. Mm -hmm. And then more and more, I kept having to uh, learn how to do accents, and, and, and the makeup got darker and yeah. darker and darker, and all because of my name. And I began to see a pattern emerge, and it began to get make me very sad. And there was no way that I knew to make that turn around. Because it was Island American girl. Indian girls. Right. Island girls, a little it, always immoral. illiterate. They didn't know how to speak. They had yeah. to have accents that nobody even taught me. So I, they would all sound like this. Even if they were Egyptian, they would sound Puerto Rican. <laughs> what did that do when you were cast in those roles and you realized this is the box I'm in? This yeah. is the box I'm in. Right. What did it do to your soul, your self-esteem? Uh, it was really seriously at risk. And as I began to see that the girls I always had to play were Ill always illiterate. Uh, they always had accents. They always had dark skin. But you know, I was so naive. Mm -hmm. I was really, I was that little Bronx girl mm -hmm. that said, they said, you know, you want to sit in the mud here and, you know, put it on your face. 
okay. okay. Whatever you ask. I don't to like do. the way it feels, but okay. It sounds like that thread of just saying okay yeah. happened in your career as well when it was, um, you know, sexual harassment obviously was rampant in Hollywood. Oh. But when you're young and naive and just all you want to do is be accepted, right? You were like the 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 perfect prey for some of these men. I had a studio head. I was like. 21 or something mm -hmm. and uh, he took one look at me and he thought "Ooh, yum yum I was really afraid this is what's so sad about me then I was deeply afraid that I might get talked into having an affair with him huh. that I would get talked into by him simply because he was so powerful mm. not because I wanted a break in films or anything nothing like that mm. but because he would just overpower me. I was really scared to death that I'd somehow allow myself to get trapped. When those things happened to you in Hollywood, and they did, how did you emerge? The only thing that saved my life, I, I know it, and I say this in my documentary, uh, was psychotherapy. Yeah. It was Marlon Brando with whom I had a eight year on off relationship who said to me one day, you really need help. You need to see someone. Was was he at that point, or as you reflect on your life, was he the love of your life? Oh, he was the lust of my life. Marlon Brando was the lust of your life. My husband was the love of my life. Mm. Marlon was the lust of my life. Mm -hmm. And that part of it was exceptional. Mm. I, I, you know, <laughs> oh, wow, that was incredible. And he was, he was really also a very interesting man. He was... Yeah. Very funny. Mm -hmm. Humor has always meant a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. humor, humor to me is sexy. Mm -hmm. Why is it sexy? Because I always think that a man who can be fast on his feet with humor can protect me. I mean, to read about and to learn about your love, your lust for Marlon Brando at that time, yeah. that was so intense that it oh. actually drove you at one point. To take pills to try to do away with my life. That's right. That just took my breath away, Rita. Yeah, it took nearly took mine away as well, permanently. He kept um, disappointing me. But you know, let's put things in proper perspective. You, you let things happen, all right? People don't, aren't just mean to you. If you keep letting them disappoint you and hurt you, then there's something wrong with this relationship, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. The straw that broke the camel's back, mm -hmm. as they say, this one deception, this hundredth deception, was in his bed, mm -hmm. asleep, and I thought, I can't do this to myself anymore. Mm. I, I just can't do this. I felt so humiliated. And I went to his bathroom and looked in the uh, medicine cabinet, and he took sleeping pills now and then. Mm -hmm. And I just stared at it for almost a half hour. And then I'd go back, and then I'd come back to the, I mean, it wasn't something impulsive. Wow. In that sense. It took thought. It took a long time, wow. because I thought, if you're going to do this, this is forever. This, this is going to be your last breathing moment. And I was in tears, huh. and I finally opened the bottle and put, I think, about 10 pills in my uh, hand and swallowed them. And I'm looking in the cabinet mirror all the time and saying, see, that wasn't so difficult. Oh, my God. Oh, it was, it was just horrific. Mm. And, you know, luckily his assistant, Alice, found me. Mm. But I was close. Wow. I was close. Wow. Oh, God, mean, I'm glad talk, that's in the, in the I past. Am, I am too. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs>
How much water ultimately will be forced inland? Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts you get one beautiful life to live jenna doesn't stop till it's sold we have this circle of women that love each other this is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. When most people say your name, they immediately think West Side Story. Nobody worked harder for a part than you did. I had an audition in every aspect of that part. And uh, before I left the last audition, which was the acting one, that were, they were very pleased with, uh, he said, now, we you know, we have to do the uh, dance audition. And he said, I have to tell you honestly, if you can't cut that, you don't get the part. Oh, jeez. So I ran to the local dancing school and took lessons all day long. I could barely afford it. Jeez. But I was in that dancing school, like from 9 to 6 in the evening, to the point where one dance teacher said to me, don't come back to my class. He said, honey, you work so hard you turn a funny shade of purple. She says, and I don't want anything to happen in my class. <laughs> so you she said, too you're for out. Her. Bye. And I remember going to yeah. the bathroom, the uh -huh. ladies' room, and looking in the mirror, and sure enough, I was the color of your <gasps> outfit. That's how hard you worked? It goes beyond red. I know you want the part. I get it. Yeah. But what drove you to that? I really felt it was my last chance to get something and do something that was meaningful. And I wanted that part so badly mm. I could taste it. Mm. And I knew, I knew I could do it just as <laughs> I just knew that I would be a wonderful Anita if they just give me, because I was Anita. Fast forward to Oscar night, your face <laughs> when they announced your name. <laughs> And you know what I loved about that moment? I mean, it was your moment, but it was not just your moment. Oh, I love you for saying that. It was that. not just your moment. It was my people. It was your people's moment. Yes. Oh my God, they cheered in Harlem. They oh, cheered they all went over. Crazy. I have a girlfriend <laughs> who told me that she, was, she lived in Harlem at the time. Yeah. And she says, normally it's a raucous place. When he came up to say best featured actress, she said the place went, Dead quiet. You know what that is in the ghetto? That's amazing. It's weird. Maybe it's the end of the earth, of the earth or something. And he announced my name, and the place went up in mm. smoke. My oh. neighborhood. People yelling out the windows. She did it. She did it. And you know, as a friend of mine said, what they were really saying was, "We did it." Oh God, that makes me want to we cry. We did it. Fast forward to this moment in time. You got to witness. Another beautiful Anita. Anita, bring home an Oscar. I, I was just, I was, I, but I'm not, I wasn't surprised. You weren't? Oh, no. 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 I kept hinting to her, and I thought I shouldn't be doing this, yeah. but I thought, how can she not? And then the reviews were insane <laughs> for her, as they were for me. I gave her every bit of support that I could. Don't think that I wasn't envious. I was. You're so honest. I but love it. But what I loved about her being cast in it was Stephen picking an Afro-Latina mm -hmm. in the role. There are tons of us around. She's remarkable. However, she's working all the time. Uh -huh. I'm not. Yeah, you didn't get work for seven years oh or so goodness, after. I could get some if I wanted to do more gang stuff mm -hmm. on a much lesser scale. But I suddenly thought, 
maybe I'm just not being represented correctly. Mm -hmm. So with his permission, my agent who was at William Morris, I made an appointment with another agent at William Morris. She said, so what do you, what do you want? And she was kind of tough and mm -hmm. to the point. And I said, well, I was wondering, and it was this kind of thing. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, maybe, uh, maybe you might be interested in handling my career for mm -hmm. a while. And there was an instant and harsh no. And then I said, can I ask why not? Mm -hmm. She said, you won't believe this. I can't believe anybody would say this. She says, because I don't think you have what it takes. Oh Tell my you, God. The blood just drained from my head into, into a little pool around my ankles. And I said, thank you. <laughs> I said, thank you. How I didn't manage to burst into tears How? at that time, I don't know. I mean, I first of all, you had won the Oscar and, and when the, she said that? And the, uh, and the uh, Golden Globe. To emerge from that and to come out after that and still grab yourself a Tony and grab yourself a Grammy in spite of that, like, that's inspirational. Like, how do you keep getting up? You just do. Because you know you're talented. I do. Yeah. I actually, I've always believed, even at my most humble, and I was, let me mm -hmm. tell you, really humble, mm -hmm. uh, I always believed that I had good stuff and that I was talented, that I needed someone. And I was so right. I needed someone to believe in me. Mm. But I never had that person. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are out. I was trying got to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans, well, nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Not only did you win the Oscar. You're the first Latina to I win the... I have them all. You got the EGOT. I have the EGOT. The EGOT. Emmy. Emmy. What's that? Uh, Grammy, Grammy. Oscar. Oscar Tony. Tony. And then the, the, uh, the one that really surprised me was the... Uh, oh, my gosh. Which one? The, uh, the Peabody? Yes. You got the Peabody. It's, it's crazy. I mean, this is... I wish you... my mom were here. <laughs> you know, it's, you win all these awards. When you gave your Tony acceptance speech, you acknowledged not just who you had become, but who you were. You acknowledged Rosita. You oh. acknowledged... Well, I said, that's right. Yes. I forgot that. I said, I'm, not only am I proud, yes. but Rosita Dolores Alverio is yes. beside herself. Yes. Or something like that. Yes. Yes. That was... I just thought that was such a huge moment because it, you had not left anything behind, not that you ever did, mm -hmm. but to stand on stage and speak it out loud was something precious, I thought. Oh my God, yeah. you're killing me. <laughs> Will you marry me if I propose? I'll be good to you. I'll make you breakfast even. <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> you know what I was wondering? You talk about the little you, the little girl in you. That's right, I call her little Rosita. Little Rosita. She's the one who still lives in me. You know, everybody thinks that once you've had therapy, <laughs> Everything is swell. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. There's still a little 
there's something in me, I call her little Rosita, who is always there to say, ha, 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 ha. I told you, I told you. Told you and what? I, I told you you couldn't make it. I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you'd be embarrassed. All that, this, that lives in me. Mm. And as I say in the documentary, the measure of being uh, mature mm -hmm. is my ability now to send her to her room. Go to your room. And you're still but sending she's her still off. There. I don't think I'm completely healed, and I don't think I will ever be. Mm -hmm. I think I'm fragile in certain ways still. Mm. Very, very sensitive. I love that you never got hard. It could That's do it. That's not in me. I, I, you know, I, I thank God for that because, yeah. honestly, I see a lot of people get that way. Because mm -hmm. I'm surprised with all, that, all the blows you took. I remember thinking once when I was doing nightclubs in Vegas, and very often the, the audience would get up and stand up, and that's before it became the thing to do. And uh, I remember going to my room, flush with all that, and the dressing room was so quiet, mm. and there was nothing there for me except my husband calling and saying, how are you tonight, how did it go? Mm. And I realized that then. I remember having a moment, an epiphany, as it were, that huh. I was very lucky. Huh. Wow. Lenny was with you for years. 46 years. 46 years. Yeah. You got the career and you got the guy. Most times you choose. Well, I got the guy, but then it turned into not a happy marriage mm. because I felt that, uh, you know, it's what I say. I, I don't want to repeat myself, but it's what I say in the documentary. People make deals with each other that are never verbalized. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really also afraid that uh, I would not be good on my own. So you on your own, your own voice, your own choices, your own decisions, nobody's putting their thumb on the scale, nobody's telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. How did you adjust to that life? Being on my own? Yeah. It was easy. <laughs> It was easy, yeah. and it was it actually it uh, it worried me because I came back. His uh, his demise happened in New York, and mm -hmm. I was in a hospital with him for about a month and a half, mm -hmm. sleeping on one of those hideous cots mm -hmm. where you can feel the floor. Mm. Yeah, uh, and I came home. I remember it was a beautiful sunny afternoon, and my assistant was there, Judy, mm -hmm. and I said. Give me a big glass of white wine. Mm. And I sat in my very pretty courtyard and I just took in the sun and I thought, I'm free. Mm. I can do anything I want now. Mm. Anything. You know what I'm struck by, what, what I find so inspiring in this conversation is your directness, your honesty. You say all the hard parts out loud. But you know you have to. You have to, particularly if you're in my business, which is full of lies and deception. For your own mental health, I think you have to be truthful. So as we sit here at 90 years old, what inspires you now? Like what kinds of things inspire you? Women. Yeah. Women. I, I, uh, I have such an appreciation, a deep appreciation of women and what they have to go through mm -hmm. to be uh, successful in life. And that doesn't mean stars. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean the head of corporation. Just handling their lives mm -hmm. and being a parent. Mm -hmm. That takes enormous amount of work and it's about time that we support it. See, I, that's what I love so much, mm -hmm. that we are supporting each other. Well, you've been marching and you've been fighting the good fight from the very beginning. You were there when Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. There are life-changing moments. I was not more than 15 feet away from him watching him do that speech. The dream. Why was it important that you were there during that I Have a Dream speech? Because it, it settled for me once and for all that I had a responsibility, mm. that I had advantages that many, many people didn't. And I'd been there when I didn't, mm -hmm. so I understood very well. Mm -hmm. I understood what 
this struggle was about. Mm -hmm. I just want to think about your cool life and the things you've, not just the things you've witnessed, but the things you've participated in. Do you, do you know at this point that you are, that you're worthy of everything you've achieved and everything? Well, I certainly feel that I've earned yeah. everything mm -hmm. that is wonderful and yeah. good and a reward. Yeah. I absolutely feel that I, that has not, I, it has not come cheaply. Mm -hmm. I've had to earn every bit of that, yeah. and I'm very proud of that. And lastly, um, you've, uh, as I keep repeating, you've changed the lives of so many people. Countless you'll never know. That's a, Most you'll astounding. never know. It's astounding. Um, what is it? <gasps> oh, I've got to tell you tell something else. Tell me. I want to know. <laughs> I had done a television interview, and I talked about my attempt at suicide. Yeah. About a year later, I was walking into the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and I see somebody across the lobby, which mm -hmm. is huge, go. Mm -hmm. So I walked toward them, and they ran toward me, and they held my hands, and they were in tears. It was a man. And he said, thank you. Huh. Oh, this is hard. He said, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> oh, jeez. And uh, that's when I thought, I, I just have to help in any way that I can. So you know, words do have meaning, and when you mm. have people playing mm. with them and saying dreadful, untrue things, mm. it's heartbreaking. Well, you're a healer. You know what? I think I am. I think I am. A healer. Okay, I think we need Kleenexes <laughs> on aisle one. Good Tuesday morning. This is it. What could be the worst travel day of the year? For millions of Americans, airport issues and winter weather packing a one-two punch of nightmare conditions. It's December 27th. This is today. Grounded, endless lines, lost luggage, the scene at the